We are going to go through the actual gifts now. I'm going to leave as much time as I can. Um, but actually, the real purpose of this is just kind of culminating with the gifts, which once again were designed to edify and strengthen the body. And they're what, once again, the bride is given for that period of time uh, between uh, the betrothal period and the actual consummation of the marriage. And so, therefore, oh, let's, let's, um, let's go. Do you know what uh, slide we were on? Okay, Thomas is getting to it. Okay, so we will just uh, wait patiently for him to get to that slide. But the purpose isn't the gifts. And so I'm going to go through these one at a time and, um, and give as much of an explanation as I can of them. And then we're going to write into the very first question that was asked. And I want to deal with it first because it's a logical question. It's something that people always ask. And it's usually one of the first things that people say to you when they catch you keeping a commandment. And that is, they say, wasn't the law nailed to the cross? Which contains the passages that we talked about uh, uh, a little bit earlier. But the word of wisdom, Sophia in the Greek, chokmah in the Hebrew. Uh, first of all, the, these gifts are given in, in a particular order for a particular reason. My personal opinion is that wisdom and knowledge are first and second for a reason. And that is because when you read 1 Corinthians, you're going to notice the first two chapters of 1 Corinthians are all about the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of man. I think Paul's trying to set us up and saying that if you begin with wisdom and knowledge and understanding and those kind of things, then all those other things will follow naturally. They have to be based upon wisdom. Now, there is a difference between wisdom that we all have because according to scripture wisdom is found in the elders well in the elders I, I almost pose that as a question <laughs> okay it's found in the elders the whole idea of wisdom as far as the word chokmah is knowledge and understanding over time that's why the elders were the men with the gray beards and the gray hair because in both in a physical and natural way they understood things over time and in a spiritual way this, the same is true remember every commandment has a natural and a spiritual reason we don't follow a father who's into rituals that was the nature of the Greek gods was giving men things to do that made no sense and it didn't matter it just showed their loyalty to the gods didn't make any difference whether it was logical or made any sense our father's not like that even the offerings even the sacrifices have a natural reason for the reason for the fat and the liver and the kidneys thereof put upon the altar. There's a natural reason for that. We don't have time to do that on this session, obviously. But there is a, a, a wisdom that is naturally knowledge over time, combined with time. So that's why, that's why young people do not have the ability to exert wisdom in their life yet because they haven't lived long enough. There hasn't been enough of the time factor involved in it. But because of that, the gift of wisdom is not the same thing. That's why they're called the manifestation gifts. We didn't go uh, through that too much, but these are manifestations. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every mind to profit with all. So there's reasons why, and it's to profit, it's to edify once again and build up the assembly. And so there's the word of wisdom naturally, but then there's the gift of wisdom. And the gift of wisdom is something you cannot learn naturally. You don't go to school for these gifts. These are things that are manifested and given by God. The Father is able, severally as He wills, to give somebody who didn't have enough time to collect this wisdom over time. One, one of the greatest examples, I know this is going to freak you out, is Yeshua Himself. Because according to the thinking of the day, Yeshua was not old enough to understand these things. You are not yet 50 years old. John chapter 8, 58, uh, 57 through 59, somewhere in there. I couldn't be more than nine chapters off, but you know what, somewhere in there, okay. Uh, you, don't, you, haven't, you haven't had enough time to collect these things. So the gift of wisdom was poured out to Yeshua to know things that would have to be manifestations of the Word of God. And so the Father can take someone who hasn't had enough time yet and give them that supernatural gift of wisdom. But I'm, I'm, maybe you've already figured that me out before we get to it. I'm not one of those people that believes every person has one of these gifts and you just spend the rest of your life finding out what your gift is. And when you have it, you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. I do not believe that. I believe that the Father gave us all these things in the Word of God when we received it. 
And the Father will give you that gift, whatever it is, severally as he wills because he's smarter than you and I and he knows when to appropriate the gift and when not to. And so there's a difference between having wisdom and having the gift of wisdom. Once again, in the natural, wisdom is knowledge over time. The gift of wisdom can be given to someone who's only 25 or 30 and hasn't had enough time in life to live out these experiences yet. Now, there's a whole lot more to do with each one of these gifts, uh, but I don't, I don't want to spend it because uh, I've got so many times to do it only so many parts of the day or so many times in the day. Paul, once again, spends the entirety of the first three chapters on wisdom. 26 times, as if to say, if you begin with this and you are faithful with this, then these other things will be poured out. Um, according to mo new, most New Testament theologians, the first letter to Corinth contains all of the critical issues of all the other letters. Um, I have a very, here comes another shameless promotion, but I have a series called uh, first Cor the, the Torah in 1 Corinthians. And it's, it's done the same way as the Brashit series is, is I take every single word in the entire first letter to Corinthians. I break them down and define them, breaking them down in Hebrew. Which reminds me of something that Neil said yesterday when we were doing those logical fallacies. He said, you know, one of the things you could put up there is that just because you break down something down in Hebrew doesn't mean it's true either. And I went, ouch, ouch, ooh. <laughs> that was a good point. I'll get you back for that. I'm telling you. Oh, anyway. Uh, and so most New Testament uh, historians will tell you that of all the, for example, of Paul, of all the controversial things that Paul says, and, and like in the book of Galatians, in Ephesians, in Colossians, here and there, actually every one of those so-called controversies are in one book, the first letter to the Corinthians. They're all in there. So you get them all. That's why I decided to do it. Let's just tackle every controversy that, that, that's associated with Paul right in that very book. Um, first two gifts involve the mind. That's why Paul says in Colossians, let this mind or, uh, be in you, uh, Philippians, I mean, that was in the Messiah Yeshua. Natural wisdom is not learned from books, but rather the experience of life. That's how natural wisdom is, is, is in the elders. A word of wisdom is supernaturally given without the experience of life. He just supernaturally gives it to you. But that doesn't mean tomorrow you're going to have the same thing, because it does it severally as he wills. Um, all of the gifts, particularly the first two, were in Yeshua. Once again, he was only 30 years old. And he had a knowledge and a wisdom that he hadn't spent enough time on earth to have that yet. And so he's just a living example of how the gifts were appropriated through him. Uh, I'm going to suggest to you that Yahweh governs the world by wisdom and not by justice. I think that's a critical phrase. Because we have a tendency to believe that our Father judges, and go not judges, but governs the world by justice. And then we have a tendency to think it's got to be our justice. Okay? He governs. Every decision he makes is because of his wisdom of all things considered. Not his justice, but his wisdom. And so sometimes when things don't seem just to us, because it comes collectively from a very wise God. And I've used this example many times, and I'm going to use it again. I alluded to it er earlier. When I was young... Um, um, the, 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 most, the, the funnest thing you did when you were a little kid, eight or nine years old, was the parade, when the parades were in town. In America, you had July 4th parades, and you had the Christmas parade, and you had the state fair parade. It was about four or five parades every year. And, and, and back when I was growing up, my, we got to the parade two hours before the parade started. And guess what? Almost everybody else did too. And you took coolers and barbecues out there with you. I think you called them chillers. Okay, you took chillers. Did I get that right? Oh, Esky. Oh, okay, the chiller came from New Zealand. Chili bin. That's it. I'll get it straight. I'm sorry. I don't remember every single thing. Okay, so uh, chili bin. Okay, whatever. It's Esky. Okay, here. Sorry. Okay, but we took those out there, whatever you call it. And, and, and we had a barbecue out there. I suppose you call that something different. That's okay. And... <laughs> and, and we cooked because it was a very exciting thing. And when you're a little kid, about the time you think the parade is starting, here's what you did about every 30 seconds. And you look and you wouldn't say anything. You wait over here and then you look again because it was exciting when you were eight years old. And then pretty soon after a while you hear, 
Ah, the parade is coming. We get all excited. We run out the street, and here comes the band. The band would always lead things off. And when you're a little kid, you go, get the band out of here. We don't want to hear the band, okay? We're waiting for the fire engine to come because the fire engine always threw candy, okay? So you would run out there and grab all the candy from the fire engine. So but the point I'm, I want to make here is that the only thing when you're a little kid, remember, if you want to enter in the kingdom, you must become as a little child. Children, the only thing a child knew about the parade was a little bit of it that passed before him at that time. And when you're eight years old, you don't know where the parade went, and you don't know where the parade came from. You judge everything by that little bit of space of time that passes in front of you. And that's all you know. But see, God knows the beginning of the parade from the end of the parade. And he makes his decisions concerning the world based upon his knowledge of everything, not just that little wisp of time that passed in front of you uh, in your life. And we just have to trust him that he, has, that he has good judgment and he does these things because he knows the end from the beginning. And so he judges the world by wisdom and not by justice. Uh, and these are examples uh, in, in the scriptures. If you want these, I'll be glad to send you the PowerPoints so you can see the difference in the Tanakh between the natural uh, ability of wisdom through age, through time, and the supernatural, uh, the, the gift, and the Old Testament and the New Testament. One of the best ways to see Hebrew words is to see their cognates. Remember, that's their family relationship with other words. And believe it or not, the, the understanding of uh, wisdom, collective knowledge over time, can be seen in its, in its cognate of a pool of water. Agam, which is translated as a pool of water in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 18. See, pools of water out in the desert pooled together over time. The rains would come, things would dry up, the rains would come and dry up, and they didn't dry up so much, and pretty soon over time they would collect. And you have a big pool of water which didn't show up overnight. It was something that collected over time. And you get a good idea of what wisdom is all about. It's knowledge through time. Then we have the gift of knowledge. Gift of knowledge, gnosis, da'at in Hebrew. There is a difference between yada and da'at in Hebrew. I don't know where my pen went, but I'll use this one. This word here, yada, yod, dalet, ayan, is translated to know. Is it a term of intimacy? As in Adam knew his wife. And she conceived and bore a child. It's an intimate term. Involves the hand of God on something, if you will. But da'at is dominantly translated as, as um, knowledge. As in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there's a difference between the two words. This word here, knowledge, is da'at. It is something as we define this word... In the natural, it is knowledge gained from an experience. Wisdom is knowledge understood through time, adding the time element, um, and in which when you get to be an elder, you can say things like, been there, done that, you know, kind of a thing. Now, that's how we express the same thing. But, but uh, knowledge is something gained from an experience. So the father in the beginning doesn't want you to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He doesn't want you to learn by your own personal experience, he wants you to listen to him. He wants you to eat from the tree of life and follow the Father. Any parent would have understood that, would have understood that. If you live in a very cold place like we do, your child can learn that that stove can scald him one of two ways. He can either put his hand on the stove and learn that it's very hot by scalding himself, learn by experience, Shane, or he can listen to you that the stove's hot and don't touch it. You see, what, you see the difference? One is gained from yada. Because he had a relationship, an intimate relationship with his papa when his, and his father, he learned that the stove was hot by not scalding himself. But if you learn it by experience. So, so knowledge is basically learned by experience. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. It's just that uh, earthly knowledge is something you gain from an experience. Something read, a personal involvement, an observation, practice, or training. Our knowledge by nature is limited to those experience or observations. This is crucial to under, in its understanding its first use. Tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We did the parade things. But the gift of knowledge okay, has given you a supernatural ability to know something you never learned. You never learned that before. That's the gift of knowledge. And the Father 
uh, reveals those so things and gives them to us separately as he wills. I'm going to keep saying that over and over because some people say, well, what do we need these things for? Well, unless you've experienced it, you wouldn't know. Sometimes people have a tendency to make something personal universal. And what I mean by that, for example, one of the things that atheists always say about God is that how come no, God never gives somebody new legs? For example, how come God never grows back a leg for a person? It's always the, they got some kind of sickness which you can't see or they were crippled and couldn't walk but they got up but they had legs. How come God doesn't cause legless people who lost them in a war? Why doesn't he give them their legs back? The first thing I say to people like that is your assumption is because you didn't see God, somebody's leg grow back, that means nobody's leg ever grew back. That's the first thing logically you have to think of. In other words, they're an ignoramus. Okay, now I mean that in the best way. That means that they just don't know. That's what ignorance means. They did not know. So they make assumptions universally based upon their own personal experience. I haven't got time to go into the details of that, but that's it's kind of what I'm saying here. That the gift, everybody is given the knowledge of something. And that's learned from an experience or something you read or an observation. But the gift of knowledge is giving somebody in that particular circumstance the ability to know something they didn't learn in a book. That's what the gift of knowledge is all about. And in the, in the, in the book and in the CD series, I go through all the examples of the natural knowledge and the gift of knowledge in the Old Testament and the New Testament. People have no problem in the New Testament. It's the Old Testament. There's the gift of faith or belief. Everybody is given a faith. Everybody has some kind of faith in the natural. The Father doesn't have to give you the gift of faith in order to believe on Him and receive Him. Everybody has the ability to do that. But that's not the same thing as the gift of faith. The gift of faith is given to uh, people as supernatural. I'm going to read it to you. All true believers begin with faith and continue to exercise faith. That's not the same thing as the gift of faith. The gift of faith is a trust that goes beyond natural faith in something or someone. Seems to contradict logic and past experience. It's the kind of faith that looks obvious failure in the faith and says, I can and I will. Put it this way. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is an example of the gifts of faith. That's why they're listed. The so-called hall of faith, which I'm sure you've heard in Hebrews chapter 11. It lists the characters who had faith that went well beyond the natural faith that everybody has. And it's a gift given to them. Some of, probably some of the early uh, church, uh, if you will, assembly believers in the first, second, and third century, based upon Fox's book of martyrs and things like that, had a supernatural faith to be able to go to that execution state, be hung upside down, or be crucified upside down, be burned. It takes a supernatural gift from God to be able to, to faithfully make your way through those kind of things. Something I don't believe we naturally have. We're kind of naturally cowards in that, in that sense of the word. Uh, yeah, and Yahweh and Abraham believed God and counted it for righteousness. That wasn't a gift of faith. That's something that everybody has the ability to do. Or else we're all in trouble. We have to wait for the gift. There's the gift of healings. There's natural healings in the Bible. And that was done through the priests. That was do, done through the balm of Gilead. Healing oils. Some of you are familiar with essential oils and healing properties of things. So there's natural ways that people are given that doesn't require a gift. But then there's the actual gift of healing, the supernatural ability to be able to, as, as severally as the Holy Spirit wills, to be able to heal someone, deliver somebody uh, from something like that, and restore them. That is a gift of healing. I've always kind of said this seriously, but, but kind of, it, it sounds like it's a joke, but I do mean it seriously. The way some people take, teaches the gifts, and that is everybody has one, and you need to find out what yours is. Suppose you're driving down the road and you see a car accident ahead of you on the road. And there's bodies laying in, in the middle of the street mixed among glass and blood and they're dying. They're passing away in the street right in front of your eyes. And the relatives are down there next to the body screaming for someone to come and heal them. And someone gets out of the car. What can I do for you? I need someone to lay their hands on them and heal them. You say, I'm sorry, I only have the gift of tongues. You know, and then you walk away. Okay? The father would say... Get out on the ground and lay your hands upon that person and I will work through them. We will get through this. That's what that supernatural gift of faith is saying. Instead of thinking, well, I don't have that gift, so I can't do anything about it. Let me call someone, you know, who does or whatever. I don't believe that that's biblical, but that's my opinion. 
um, there is a natural healing and there's a supernatural healing. Um, let's go to the next gift, the uh, gift of miracles. Actually, it's not the gift of miracles. Technically, it's the working of miracles, which involves the word for energy once again. Working, energamata, dunamion in the Greek, which is uh, the miracles, the energy, the power. Dunamis is, is, is a word in Greek that means, yes, um, uh, dunamis. Yeah, did I say dunamis? Put the action on the wrong syllable. Uh, pardon me? Oh, anyway, uh, that's, that's where we get dynamite, you know, all those kind of things. I'm sure you're all familiar with that particular word. But it's the combination of a word that's translated also where we get dynamite from and energy. It's the working of these things. And so the idea of miracles are actually signs in Hebrew. They're signs. More than our Western concept of what a miracle is, is usually what's attributed to the mythical stories of the gods and heavens rather than signs from God. So Hebrew employs the idea of ot, signs. It's interesting that, once again, in Hebrew, if you take the words for the Messiah in the New Testament, which are also attributed to yod heh vav in the Old Testament, that is, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, and the last, which, of course, is the Hebrew word et, okay, or aleph tav. So it's just aleph tav. So if you take the Hebrew word that's given as an expression of Yahweh, he is the, alpha, he is the aleph and the tav, he is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Now that's all over your Tanakh. But yet when you get to the New Testament, the same thing as you said of Yeshua, particularly in the first two chapters of Revelation. He's the beginning, the end, the first and the last. Now in Hebrew, that would be written in ancient Hebrew like this. He is the Aleph and the Tav. Aleph and the Tav. That's a description of the Hebrew language or the word. The word of God is summarized just with the words Aleph Tav, which is the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So in Hebrew, when we, want to, when we want to speak of all 22 letters of the alphabet, we just say Aleph Tav. Why? Because we don't want to sing the dumb song like in English. Okay? In English, we just say alphabet. So we do the same thing in English. It's not a Hebrew thing necessarily. Most cultures do that. They shorten things down to short little statements because we don't want to sing the song. We just want to say, yes. Now, if you take that which is speaking of the Messiah, hanging on the tree. Remember, I'm only going to give you one sign. If you take the yod and you put it right between the aleph and the tav, now you have the Hebrew word for a sign, ot. All right? So the aleph and the tav says to the religious systems, I'm only going to give you one sign, which is the, as some of you well know, the aleph and the tav speaks of the Messiah, and the, and the Vav speaks of the nail, right? It's the Hebrew letter of the nail. So you take the Aleph and the Tav, you hang him on a tree with the nail, and now you have the sign. Do you see what I'm saying? And so he says to the Pharisees, I'm only going to give you one sign. And what was that? I'm going to hang on that tree, and I'm going to be buried in the belly of the earth for three days and for three nights. Anybody that understood the language at the time would have probably understood that the, literally the Aleph and the Tav was going to be nailed pierced with that nail on that tree and now it's the Hebrew word for sign. Just a coincidence that the root of the word for Aleph Tav is Ot or the sign. Remember I told you most Hebrew words are based upon three letter roots, not two letter roots. Okay, anyway, for, uh, aside from that, um, the Hebrew word used in, 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 uh, in, in Hebrew, in biblical Hebrew is Pa'al. Pei Ayin Lamed. There it is right there. He hath wrought, pei ayin lamed. That is translated into the Greek word uh, for working, energy, doing things. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Hebrew, then you'll know that pa'al is the root of all the verb stems in Hebrew. Hifael, puel, piel, nifil, okay, so forth. Those are all based upon pei ayin lamed. Why? Because verbs are the what? Action. Energy, do something. That's what verbs are. So, that, so that's named for the verb stems in Hebrew because verbs are what causes people to actually do things as opposed to nouns, once again. Now, um, let's move on uh, in our gifts to the gift of prophecy. Prophetea, uh, Nava, uh, Nun, Vav, or Nun, Bet, Aleph. 
is the root of the gift of prophecy. This all comes from the two-letter root, which is nuv. Nuv in Hebrew. And so from nuv, we get nun bet aleph, which is translated as a prophet. But actually, the word comes from something budding, sprouting fruit. Nuv, to bud or sprout uh, fruit. Uh, so what's the point of this? A prophet, what a prophet does, and judging what a prophet does, is, is, is based upon the fruit he produces. The fruit will always match the seed. If the seed of the word of God is in him, then he'll always produce the same fruit. Everything he prophesies, everything he says, which is his fruit, what comes forth will be based upon the seed. And so therefore, the root of prophecy is the word for something bearing fruit, budding, producing fruit. Uh, and you can see that uh, once again in uh, uh, Hirsch's work, and you can see it uh, also in Klein's work. And for those of you who may be familiar with Jeff Benner, uh, the ancient Hebrew lexicon, okay, you can, you can investigate that, do, uh, do Benner's work as well. Prophets are based upon, so, so a false, false prophet is based upon if he leads you according to the ways of the Father, then he's producing the same fruit. And so it's based upon something agriculturally out uh, in the... Uh, but some people, uh, the, the natural prophecy is to be able to look at something and based upon the Word of God, you can judge what's going to happen. My personal belief, you don't have to agree with this, but my personal belief is one of the examples of natural prophecy was Jonah and, and Nineveh. I mean, if you're told in the Scriptures that if you obey me, I will bless you, and if you don't, you will be cursed or exactly not blessed... Then when Jonah looks over Nineveh and he says all the debauchery and chaos, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out you're not going to last very long. Okay, in other words, he took the word of God and the natural and could make a prophecy about what was going to happen to Nineveh because he could see what all the people were doing. And I believe, of course, the gift of prophecy is the supernatural ability to be able to reveal something that you did not know. If you already knew it, then go ahead and prophesy it forth. You don't need the gift to, to do that. Um, discerning of spirits. Uh, this is this, there's a, a, an ability for all of us to discern something. But then there's a gift of discerning. In which in a particular situation. God supernaturally gives you the ability to discern something in that particular moment. That you could not have learned or read about. Or didn't have that experience in life. So my, my basic overall comment about the gifts until we get to these last two, because these last two are what make all the papers, all right? They're the ones that get all the headlines. Most people in this walk that we ostensibly call Hebrew roots will say things, you know, when I came into this walk, when I learned about the Sabbath, I love the Sabbath. I love that Sabbath idea. I like the idea of resting, actually resting on that day and reading the Word of God, and being with my family and blessing my kids and, and for the rest of the week. And I love that. And those feasts, particularly that Sukkot thing, whoo, is that a hoot? I love that stuff. I love to go and party with everybody, you know, for eight days. But those gifts of the Spirit, I, I don't want those things being restored, see? So we're just doing typically what Western religions do with the Ten Commandments. You know, all the Ten Commandments are in force except for the one in the middle, of course. We don't have anything to do with that. Uh, and so we all have a tendency of what I'm trying to say. We're not immune for picking and choosing what we want restored and what we don't want restored. We all have a tendency to do that, even in this walk. And so it's the last couple of gifts that get all the headlines. Now, I'm going to uh, stop here because I don't want to spend an inordinate amount of time dealing with this particular issue and so I'm going to write it on the board instead of going through this alright if that's okay that's what I would rather do the last two gifts are speaking in an unknown tongue and interpretation of that tongue as you well know the assumption of course is that this is a New Testament gift given to the body until the canon was complete in other words the Bible and then once the canon is complete they didn't need that gift anymore now that seems very plausible and that seems uh, you can be convinced of something like that only if you believe that starting in the fourth century every person on the planet had a Bible now 
Unfortunately, even as I'm speaking to you today, still the majority of people in this world have never seen a Bible. So if the gifts were only given until the canon was complete, now you can read your Bible and you don't need the gifts anymore, we got a whole lot of people in trouble. Because most people, even with the internet today, have never seen a Bible. That's why some people misunderstand when I say in my lectures, are you trying to say that unless we know Hebrew, we cannot understand our Bibles? Well, then if that's true, if that's what you think I'm saying, then 99% of the world doesn't know their Bibles because 99% of the world's never seen us a lick of Hebrew, never read anything in Hebrew, don't even know the word Hebrew. And the same is true for those who believe only in, 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 in Greek primacy or Aramaic primacy, whichever one of those terms you want to use. Uh, a, a lesser percentage, probably 95% of the world, doesn't know a Greek word, you know, from Chinese. And so, no, what I'm saying is that the words in your Bible are all revealed in the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees in which no matter where you live on planet Earth, everybody sees that. Everybody can see it in action wherever they go on the Earth. God's got it covered. He knows exactly what He's doing. And that's why Romans chapter 1, verse 20 says, The invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things which are made. So nobody, nobody stands before God with an excuse. I didn't make up that last part. That's part of Romans chapter 1, verse 20, by the way, okay? And so this idea of speaking an unknown tongue, maybe I should bring up some of them here, okay? Nagun, N-I-G-G-U-N, so you can look at it, how it's spelled up there. Now, I'm going to talk about what this ancient word means, and then we're going to get into the first question. I don't want to spend an unusual amount of time on it. I decided one day that I would look up this word and see how it's understood from a modern point of view. So I put the word nagoon up there, and I saw something called the Urban Dictionary. And it gave me the definition, a Jewish song or portion of a song. So it's singing, where no words are sung, but syllables, such as la, 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 na, 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 whatever. In a very spiritual way, musically comparable to scat singing and jazz, but much more spiritual. A great example was Kathy. She was singing today, and she went right into that. Now, some of you think that means we forgot the words. <laughs> but the difference between the, a nagoon is words that are sung from the heart, Amen. not the mind. And in ancient times, they were sung, not spoken. So what was sung up in the at the time of Yeshua, even past the time of Yeshua, even on today, the Western world turned, to, turned into, untie my bow tie, who's on my Honda? If you understand what I just said. <laughs> yeah, we have an interpretation of that. Okay. Untie my bow tie, who stole my Honda? Untie my bow tie, who stole my Honda? Okay. That's being a goofy example of something you hear today because it was sung in ancient times. One of my favorite rabbis, Solomon Schechter, a wonderful man, no longer with us today. But he visited a Pentecostal assembly. This is years ago because he's been dead for quite a long time now. And he pulls the pastor aside in the assembly after he's done. And he says, it was a very interesting service that you had today. And he says, because the only difference is many times what you are doing here, we, do, we Jews do as well. But we sing it while you only say it. Okay, now I'm going to give you an examples of this. So, so give me some time for those of you giving me the third eye or whatever. Um, but, 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 but just, just to clarify a little bit, when, when, I, when I put this in a book, when I wrote the, when I wrote the book about this, which is called Gifts of the Bridegroom, and they were supposed to all be here, <laughs> but they're in your customs uh, office once again. Our um, editor at that time uh, called up or emailed, I don't know if she called her email, and she says, do you know that UrbanDictionary.com is a pornographic website? What? Now, she overstated it. Uh, actually, UrbanDictionary.com is a place that gives you the definition of very crude slang words as well. I'm telling you this just in case you check me out. And you should check me out and look up this word on Urban Dictionary. So you may see some other things there that I did not know. Because when I looked it up, it just went to that definition. And I didn't know anything about, else about it. I just wanted a modern definition of this word. 
From uh, stories beyond Hasidic songs that inspire Jews, it is written, and I quote, Hungry, a Jew searches because his Jewish soul won't let him rest until he has come to hear what he needs to hear and to say what he needs to say. Hungry, he turns to music when words fail, and he looks up to him and sings his heart out. With the right intent, kavanah in Hebrew, with the right intent, any Jew who sings a nagun always reaches his creator. In a sense, a nagun is a combination of parent-child sounds that no one else can understand, a stammering infant, infant language. Is it starting to make sense a little bit? Now, there's, the reason I'm saying this, there's purposes for this. And we're going to go through those purposes for those of you who were taught in a system in which all those things were done away with uh, as soon as the canon was complete. And I'm going to suggest to you, no, there were not. This is something that's been from the very beginning. I believe right, right from the garden. But we don't have time to get into all those details. But I want to give you some examples. In the times of Yeshua, there was a rabbi named Rabbi Steinman. S-T-A-I-M-A-N. Rabbi Steinman. Rabbi Steinman was of the house of Hillel. Some of you know that in the first century, there were two basic, even though there were eight or nine different sects of Judaism in the first century, they were based primarily on two the school or house of Hillel and the school or house of Shammai. Those are the two divisions. Now there were others that came forth from it. And guess what? Those two schools didn't like each other. Surprise, surprise. And so one day, Steinman, which is, Yeshua primarily leaned toward the house of Hillel more than he leaned to the house of Shammai. And so Rabbi Steinman is teaching his, his students um, in, in a classroom. And so the house of Shammai sends some students to that class to mess with him, to irritate him. So they started firing questions at Rabbi Steinman over and over and over, and he did a pretty good job for about 15 minutes of ignoring all their questions. Pretty soon he got a little fed up with the questions. Now, let me stop and say this. The whole point of telling you these stories is what Hebrew thinks about this, this gift. It's not whether you believe it's true or not true. The point is they understood these things too. That's my point. And so he, he got irritated, so he sent all of his students out of the room, and he turned to them and spoke in a, go, in, a go, in a nagoon and answered all their questions at the same time. In other words, he spoke in a kol, kof lamed, kof holom of lamed, a voice. He spoke to them singular in a voice, and everybody understood what he said, even though they all asked him different questions. See, the father at that time used that, gave that ability to him for being able to do that for just such an occasion of that. How dare we say that these things don't happen just because they don't happen in our personal world, then they don't happen anywhere on the planet. This, this, this is the kind of thinking processes that causes the division all the time. You and I don't have universal knowledge. Give God a break. Give him the ability to do what he can do and wants to do without putting him in little boxes all the time. And so, at, of course, at the mount, if you're familiar with the Hyksos, raise your hand if you know who the Hyksos are, okay? They were these, um, uh, some people believe they were Arabs, some people believe they were Jews, some people believe they were Hittites and Hurrians. I believe they were all of the above. And what they did is they came in to Egypt when Israel was in captivity in Egypt. And they taught them to war. They brought the composite bow. They brought the chariot to them. And they brought horses to them. Horses are not indigenous to Egypt. They had to bring them in. Horses and chariots are warring, fighting machines. And so Egypt, in that 17th and 18th dynasty, was not necessarily a violent country at that time. But the Hyksos came in. Hyksos is translated uh, as uh, shepherd kings or kings of the earth. Does that sound familiar? Um... Uh, the father of uh, William F. Albright, when he discovered these guys, he said that previously they were called shepherd kings, but he says he believes the translation from Egyptian, the Coptic languages, into Greek was the Hyksos, which means kings of the earth. The reason I bring that up is because your Bible in Old Testament and New Testament is filled with these kings of the earth who come in the latter days and they hide in the rock dens of the rocks and, and so on and so forth, the kings of the earth. Uh, Psalm chapter 2, the kings of the earth speak against the, uh, the Father and, and the Messiah. And, and these kings of the earth are all over the place. And so at that time, that's why I believe Obama, I do not believe Obama was a Muslim. I believe our president, former president, was a Hyksos. I wouldn't be surprised if Bush is, has nothing to do with color. Color's got nothing to do with it. But he was a Hyksos. A Hyksos is a mixture of everything. 
And so the point being was to take down Egypt from within. Take them down from within. The whole idea is to, re is to destroy the wheat. They're the tares. That while men weren't paying any attention, at the time, Egypt, the enemy came in and planted the tares among the wheat. Why? The wheat in Egypt is making bricks of straw and mud. And they're working for the man. Okay, and they were in captivity, if you remember. And what the Hyksos did was teach the Egyptians to war and fight. So they started conquering the nations around them. And when they took their captives and they put them in with the Hebrews in order to make bricks of straw and mud. And so they worked together. And when Israel came out, a mixed multitude came up with them. All right? And so, therefore, wherever the wheat goes, here the wheat leaves Egypt, there come the tares along with them. Why? To destroy them from within. The point being is at the bottom of Mount Sinai, when the Father spoke, there was a mixed multitude. Now, remember the mixed multitude in Acts chapter 2. So we have the whole Shavuot thing, we have the whole mountain thing, and in Acts chapter 2, a voice, if you will, comes down as cloven tongues of fire, and everybody understood in their own language, as you remember, what was spoken. All coming from these cloven tongues of fire, they all heard them speak in their own language. And so therefore at Mount Sinai, we have mixed languages, mixed people at the bottom of the mountain. And do you remember at first, they wanted Father to speak to them. Speak to us, speak to us, speak to us. So the Father spoke to them and what did they say? Don't speak to us, don't speak to us. Okay, you remember that, all right? And so the point being is that the Father wanted to speak to his people. They're the ones that said, don't speak to us. So he spoke to Moses. I say that because we get people running around the world saying, well, you know, God only gave us the Ten Commandments, and all the rest of the commandments come from Moses. And so what was done away with the, at the cross was everything but the Ten Commandments. Oh, except for the one in the middle of the Ten Commandments, okay? You know what I mean? And so, and why do they say that? Because... There, the, the Ten Commandments were given by God and all the rest of them were given by Moses. But the Father wanted to give them all the commandments. They're the ones that said, don't speak to us. So he spoke through who? Through Moses uh, to the people. And in Exodus chapter 9, he says he spoke to them three times, it says it. He spoke to them in singular, in a singular voice, and they all understood what he said at the bottom of the mount. So who's speaking in a language, how can you speak in a known language and all these various languages understand what you said if you're speaking in a known language? Now, let me put it to you this way. In traditionally, in uh, Christian circles, in Western religious circles, people are taught either one of two things. Either that language in Acts chapter 2, which only happens in Acts chapter 2, by the way. There's no repeating of what happens of all the occurrences in Acts chapter 2. But that was a known language. It's just it was not known by the people who were speaking it and hearing it. That's one view. The other view is no, it's just a rambling, a babbling. It was an unknown uh, language and didn't, it was not a known language. And so everybody runs into one of those two camps, right? Because that's the way we do things in Western worlds. We either go this way or we join this club or we're part of this club. Either way. When the Holy Spirit has the perfect ability to be able to do either one of those severally as he wills when he wants to. So I believe that there's times when the Father gives someone the supernatural ability to speak a language that's known, it's just they didn't know it. But there's also times when he's able to speak a language that nobody knows. It's not a known language, it's called a nagoon because he has a purpose in doing this. And I will give you a couple examples and then, and then we'll uh, close and get to the question. I don't want to belabor this too much, but I want to give you a modern day example of Nagoon. Tevye is in the barn with the cows and the chickens. Tevye is a poor milkman. Tevye wants to be a rich man. He doesn't want to be a poor milkman. He wants to be a rich man. So all of a sudden he turns and says, if I were a rich man, vidi 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 bum, all day long I'd vidi vidi bum, if I were a wealthy man, hey, I wouldn't have to work hard. Okay, you know how it goes, right? All right. <laughs> now, that was goofy, I admit, okay. But see, it wasn't as if the writer of rich man couldn't think of words to rhyme with man. 
They put a Nagoon in there. And the author, actually, not the author, but the director of the movie says that that is a Nagoon. That is an ancient Nagoon. It's interesting as a side note to me that the director of the movie was not Jewish and admits he's not Jewish. And his name was Norman Jewison. <laughs> What's up with that? Okay. Uh, I mean, if you just, you know, son of a Jew, was that, basically, was what that, but he says he's not. So anyway, but he knew a lot about the culture. That's a modern day version of what we're talking about here. The ability to express something as the Holy Spirit severally wills, uh, even if it's not a known language. Now, now, I'm making a distinction between the fact that Paul emphasizes the fact that this gift apparently is something individually that's between you and God, which means that you need to keep it between you and God, and prophecy. If it's in a prophetic atmosphere, it needs to be interpreted. That's the design. If it's something between you and God, and I'll just tell you right now, I speak in tongues more than y'all, okay? But I've only had it happen once, publicly. It usually happens to me, and Carol can verify this, when I'm sitting playing the keyboards and it's late at night and I'm very moved and so forth, and I, and I just can't form English words and my, and my heart begins to take over. And it's such a blessing. But see, I don't, won't do that publicly because the Father, or Paul says he would rather that you prophesy. prophesy a prophecy, in other words, something that the, the, the assembly understands that will build them up, not just you. Up. And so I remember uh, one time uh, uh, years ago, we were going to a concert in, um, in Roosevelt, which is not too far from us. And this was back in the days when um, a cappella groups were real popular in contemporary Christianity. And so we went over there with a, with a couple from the Baptist church who we didn't want to have anything to do. You know, the Baptists, no, no, it's all done away with. See, see in, 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 in America, Tongues is either evidence of the baptism of the Spirit or it's straight from hell. Okay, you know, and everybody takes, right? Everybody takes one of those positions and everybody lines up on one side and throws stones at the other side all the time, uh, not realizing that the Father's perfectly capable of expressing these things severally as he will. So anyway, we're going there. And it was a wonderful uh, a cappella thing. And the pastor stands up at the end and he, and he prays and, 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 they, and they dismiss and we're driving in the car on the way back, and they're sitting in the front seat. And she turns to her husband, and she says, Ray, wasn't, wasn't that the most beautiful prayer that you ever heard? And boy, Ray gives her a dirty look like something else. Yikes, going to stay out of this one, okay? A few minutes goes by, and she turns to him again. She says, Ray, didn't you love that pastor's prayer? That was such a beautiful prayer. He turns to her, and he says, he babbled in that tongues thing. What are you talking about? And she goes, no, he didn't. He spoke perfect English. Okay, see, the, the father had something for her, not for him. And believe it or not, worldwide, that happens all the time. Just because it doesn't happen in our little lives doesn't mean it doesn't happen everywhere else. Once again, the difference was that in Hebrew, these things are sung. Psalm 3, 4, and 5 all begin with the psalm of the Neganoth. You can read that in your psalms. Some rabbis believe, some rabbinical teaching believes that, that, that David took a 22-string harp, not the typical 10-string, but a 22-string harp, hung it up on the tree, and when the wind blow, blow, blows through it, because Nagoon literally in Hebrew means the plucking of a liar, and not Hillary Clinton, not, not that liar, okay, but a guitar, okay, it literally it's a kind of a plucking of guitar strings. And so, therefore, it's not a known language. But it comes forth from that kind of idea. And that when the wind blew, that harp, that David interpreted that and wrote the Psalms from that. And so, therefore, Psalm chapter 3, I'm not trying to get all weird on you. Don't get me wrong. Um, but Psalm, three and, uh, Psalm 4 says, to the chief musician of the Negano. That's just Nagoon in the feminine plural. That's all it is. It's the same thing. You can see it on uh, Psalm, Psalm, Psalm chapter 6, for example. And there's three or four others which start out that way. Um, and so it's using the exact same word. As a matter of fact, I've got example after example. When uh, David played his lyre, L-Y-R-E, for David and the demons were expelled, that's a nagoon. The word is a nagoon. Now, what did I say? 
Yeah, David played it for Saul, and the demons departed Saul and so forth. That's a nagoon. That's something that was sung. That's the major difference between speaking it and singing it. And the uh, only reason I'm bringing this up is not to get everybody to run out of here and speak in tongues. That's not my point. My point is, once again, this is nothing new, and I believe these things are going to be restored in the latter days, not just for the edification of self, but also for the edification of the body. It's going to be one of those things. Can you imagine a group of us together in one place and where we're going through much tribulation and somebody busting in on us and not being able to understand what we were saying, but we knew what we were saying, okay? Uh, I can see these kind of scenarios possibly happen uh, in the future unless you're a pre-tribulation rapture guy and they're going to zap us out of here and uh, then, you know, I have a leg to stand on then. But um, I believe all these things are seen in these ancient nagoons. And the only difference is that, once again, that they are sung instead of spoken. All right, with that in mind, uh, my whole purpose uh, yet last night and today was to give you reasons based upon the physics of the universe why we can't accomplish something unless we all work together. If nothing else, you got that out of the fact that everything in the universe testifies to that reality. That things may be good individually by themselves, but they're not tov mio, they're not very good until they collectively work together. Now I'm going to do something that uh, I was asked about when uh, one of the things that are brought up, uh, this totally switches, uh, switching subjects here, uh, because we got one hour. Is everybody okay? Can you handle one, hour, one more hour? I actually, quite frankly, I'm terribly pleased and shocked at the same time because usually on an all-day thing like this, uh, because I can stand and talk a lot longer than you can sit and listen, all right? Um, but, and, 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 and that's getting worse and worse as time goes on, but... Uh, but I'm really surprised that this many of you, of you have stuck it out all day long. And I'm very honored that you did so. Uh, thank you for doing that because usually by now we're down to about six, okay, because everybody's totally pooped out. Um, and so when Yeshua talks about eating clean and, and things of that nature, once again, Yeshua ate what was clean. Every theologian agrees with that. Uh, but then we get into passages like, when people keep, catch you keeping the commandments, they tell you, but wasn't the Torah, or the law, they don't say Torah, wasn't the law nailed to the cross? Now, even though nine out of ten people that say that to you don't know where that is even written, they just hear that all the time, the reality is it's in the book of Colossians. And so I want to talk about this because that's where the, uh, Paul talks about being judged in the things you eat, in the feast, and things of that nature. But I want to begin in, uh, by going there. Let's go to Colossians. Because the same words that are in Colossians of the blotting out of handwriting of ordinances is also in Ephesians chapter 2, that middle wall of partition that came down. The same word is used there. And so when we go to Colossians chapter 2, I want to remind you of something. Paul... One of the identification, uh, identifying factors of Paul is that Paul says this little phrase over and over and over again that if you take all the other disciples, put them together and multiply it times 10, he still says this more than all the other disciples times 10. This is one of those things that identifies Paul as, as the writer of a gospel, even though we really don't need that because I'm a writer of a gospel, read of, a, of an epistle. Even though we don't need that because Paul begins all his letters by saying, I, Paul, an apostle of, so he tells you anyway. But even if he didn't say that, Paul says something over and over and over again that only, basically only Paul says. Rarely do the other writers even mention this phrase. And to give you a modern example, if you're in the Hebrew Roots Walk and someone says, well, the guy kept saying God is smarter than we are over and over and over again, who do you think that would be? Okay, well, yeah, see, because there are certain things and terminology that identify with certain uh, teachers out there. Uh, if you were talking about the, the talking note of the Pharisees, I don't know how much you are familiar with that term, that's your husband, okay? That's Avi Ben Mordecai's wife, I'm sure you know that. Avi Ben Mordecai is a very well-known teacher in this walk as well. Currently in Israel, I also will be smoozing with him in a few days, okay? But there are certain things that are identified with certain teachers, and so the same is true with Paul. Now here comes the phrase, I'm going to say it in your King James English. And then I'm going to say it the way we would say it in Hebrew. 
Okay, where we see it in this walk. Now here's something that Paul says over and over and over again. Dozens and dozens of times. Here's what he says. Christ in you. Christ in you. Now we would say Mashiach, okay, in you. But the King James English says Christ in you. That's one of the identifying characteristics of Paul. He says that over and over and over. And I'm going to suggest to you the reason why he keeps saying it over and over again, Michael, is because he wants you to know that Christ is in you. I know that's kind of a given, but what he's saying is the Pope ain't in you. The Pharisees aren't in you. Brad's not in you. Moses is not in you. Your church is not in you, but the Messiah is in you, so you do what he does because he's the only one that's in you. You get the point. And he especially says that before every controversial thing, including these comments in Colossians chapter 2 about being nailed to the cross and judging people and food and drink, things of that nature. Because without understanding these little things, people assume that Paul is contradicting Yeshua. When he says, no, all these food and things were done away with. And so therefore you can ever eat what you want, you can celebrate what you want, uh, you can rest on the days that you want. This is all based upon a misunderstanding of Paul, which would be a misunderstanding depending on how someone tells the story. Remember the riddle um, that I told a little while ago. So when you read Colossians 1, six times in the first uh, chapter of Colossians, it tells you Messiah is in you. He is in you, you are in him. He keeps repeating that over and over and over. And again, when he gets to Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 3, he says, And the Messiah, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Now let's stop right there. The first thing he says is he warns them that a man's going to come and deceive you with enticing words. The word used in King James English is beguile you with enticing words. Now where can you remember in scripture did someone first try to deceive someone with words? The serpent in the garden. All right. There are some people in this walk that thinks that beguile means to have sex with her. Uh, believe it or not, they don't know a lick of Hebrew, okay, but they just they draw these conclusions based upon a little bit of knowledge and they get extremely dangerous. The idea of this word Nassah is, is to deceive, to deceive using words. And so how do we know that? We go back to the garden and he turns to the woman and he says, Hath God said. That starts the process of deception right there. So the last person that deceived people was in the garden. Remember how many witnesses we have to have for something to be true. But the, the, the key is they have to agree with each other. So we're about to get three witnesses here of the same man. Same man. Bear with me slowly. Because Paul's building up. Because too many people just quote Colossians 2.14 and they don't quote the context of any of it. Once again, Paul reminds you it's the Messiah in you so you do what he did. Because he knows his own brothers in the flesh are going to come and try you to get to follow their traditions, their philosophies, their way. But Paul's trying to tell them, my brothers in the flesh are not in you. The Pharisees and Sadducees are not in you. Who is in you? The Messiah. So you follow the Messiah. You don't follow them. You follow the only one that's in you. He's the one that gave you the genetic information to be able to do anything good. So it says... This I say, lest any man should decide, deceive you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, joy in beholding your order and steadfastness of your faith. Guess what? In Messiah. He says it again. Verse 6. As ye have therefore received the Messiah, Yeshua, the Lord, so walk in him. That word walk. Halakha. Halakha. Walk like he does. Why? Because once again, he's the one that's in you. So you, that's why Yeshua said, take up your cross and halakha after me. Halakha in your Old Testament is translated to go, to follow, uh, to walk, things of that nature. Different translations dependent upon its, its, its position in the sentence. Then in verse 7 it says, you are wilted, rooted and built up in who? Him. And established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Now we have the second witness of this man. Beware lest any man. We just heard lest any man should deceive you with words. Now that same man is going to try to spoil you 
through philosophies, vain deceits, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after who? Messiah. This is going to come together, but Paul tries to pound it in our brains. You follow the Messiah, not these men that are going to come to you and get you to follow them. Are you with me? I hope so. Now we go down, go on down to verse 14, because he's going to talk about the nature of the Messiah. Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Western theologians, that's the Torah, was nailed to the cross. And I, don't, I know it's not what it says, but they, not, not, not is not only what it says, but when the context, once again, is that this man's going to come to you. He's speaking about his own brothers in the flesh, and they're trying to get, get you to follow them. That was Paul's even thorn in his side, when Paul talks about his thorn uh, early on in the Corinthians. It, it, it is that having to deal with his own brothers in the flesh, all the, all the persecution he got from his own brothers in the flesh, and it was constantly a thorn in his side. We don't have time to go through the details of that, but blotting out the handwriting. In your Bible, every time you see the English word ordinances, it's translated from the Hebrew word chukim and the Greek word paradosis. The Greek word paradosis and the Hebrew word chukim, which is speaking about the ordinances of God. Every single time except two times in the New Testament. In the New Testament, it's translated into the Greek word, from the Greek word dogma, in the middle wall of partition and here, blotting out the handwriting of dogma that was against you. I wish I could put the PowerPoints up here so you could see the breakdown of the words. First of all, the Torah is never called dogma. Not once is the Torah, the commandments of God, ever called dogma. What is called dogma? The decrees of the kings and Caesars and the decrees of the religious systems. That's what's called dogma throughout Scripture. Two times the word dogma in Greek shows up in your Old Testament. First time. So this is what's blotted out, right? The blotting out of handwriting of dogma that was against you. Not the commandments of God. That's the first most important thing. And as a matter of fact, when you go back to the middle wall of partition, the most important thing about that, because New Testament teaching teaches that the middle wall of partition was the Torah, was taken down. He destroyed it. But the first thing you should do is know what is the middle wall of partition. That's the first thing you should investigate. Because when you go back to the Tanakh, to the Old Testament, you go back to the building of the tabernacle, you look at the instructions to build the tabernacle, there's no instructions to build a middle wall in the tabernacle. Now that should, light bulbs should start going off right there. Then you go read the instructions for the building of the first temple called Solomon's temple. You'll notice that there's no commandment from God to put up a middle wall called a sorig. No commandment from God to put up a middle wall in the first temple. Then you go read the instructions of Zerubbabel's temple, which refurbished became Herod's temple. And you'll notice there's no instructions to build a middle wall in any of those temples. So what is the middle wall and where did it come from? Josephus tells us. Josephus tells us in the days of Herod when they were refurbishing the temple, they got together with the rabbinical leadership at that time and they put up a middle wall in Herod's temple. It's not God that put up the middle wall. God's not taking down his own wall. God didn't put up the Torah and now he's taking down the Torah. The purpose of the Sorig, of the middle wall, was to keep the Gentiles out of the, the, the place of the Jews. It was to separate the Jew from the Gentile, which is basically what the whole book of Romans is all about. In the Messiah, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. It's because of the teaching of the rabbis and the teaching combined with the decrees of the kings that this wall was put up, and who's going to take it down? Yeshua. Yeshua is going to destroy that wall. Now let's go to the two times that the word dogma is used in the Old Testament. The first time comes from the decree from Haman to hang, I was hoping someone would do that. When I say Haman, what do you do? Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Because he was building, building gallows to hang Mordecai. No, he's the yay. Okay, don't get this messed up, crowd. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's try this again. The decree from Haman Ooh. to hang Mordecai. 
on the gallows, okay? And so the word decree is not the Torah. The decree is the, comes forth from the political systems and the religious systems. They put up things that are burdensome. The commandments of God are not burdensome. It's when men start adding to the commandments of God, then it becomes burdensome and impossible to do. Let me give you an example. Let's pretend that the commandment is a hole in this floor, okay? This is weird, but bear with me. The commandment is a hole in the floor. The commandment is do not fall into the hole. That's the commandment. So the father says, don't fall into a hole. So the religious systems come along and says, well, what if I accidentally trip and fall in the hole? So we'll put a fence around the hole. Okay? Why did they put a fence around the hole? In case you trip and accidentally fall in the hole. And so then someone comes along and says, what if I trip and fall and crash through the fence and fall in the hole? So they put another fence around it. All right? And so another rabbi comes along and says, what if I trip and fall through that fence and stumble and fall over the next fence and fall into the hole? So they put a third fence. So they keep putting these fences around the hole. And what happens is when the fences become the commandments. When the fences are not the commandments, the commandment is what? Don't fall in the hole. But then when they added, they kept adding. Now, the, the motivation, I believe, was good in many ways. They wanted to keep from falling in the hole. But the commandment is not the fences. The commandment is don't fall in the hole. And so, therefore, falling in the hole is something you don't want to do. God's not going to give you a commandment that's not good for you. God's commandments are not burdensome. But when men start putting fences around them, and if you tear down the fence, you're breaking the commandment. No, you are not. The commandment is don't, don't fall in the hole. Are you with me on that dumb example? And so, he's saying the blotting out of handwriting of dogma that was against you. So the first occurrence in the Old Testament is the decree, the dogma, to have the Jews killed, hung on the, uh, hung on the gallows. Now, is that decree the Torah? No, it's the decrees of the Caesars, it's combined with the religious systems of the day. The second time is the commandment to put, to throw Daniel in the lines, excuse me, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, Abednego in the fiery furnace. The decree came forth from the king to throw them in the fiery furnace. Did that come from God? No, it came from the Caesar, from the decrees from the kings. Anyone, one of you know, when you live in a country that's filled with laws and laws, multitudes of law, that's what burdens, that's what burdens the people. In America, you've got tens of thousands of laws that most Americans have no problem with, but they have a big problem with 613 in the Bible. Kind of ridiculous. They don't mind tens of thousands of them, but they have a problem with only 613 which wouldn't even need to be given if we didn't obey the ten, which wouldn't need to be, be given if we just loved the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, which is designed for Adam and Eve in the garden in the first place. And so Paul says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances against us. Now the door dogma shows up many times in the New Testament, and it's generally translated as a decree came forth from Caesar to have the people numbered. Okay? So dogma has nothing ever in any place to do with the Torah. So Paul's saying, blotting out the handwriting of dogma that's against you, having taken it out of the way and nailed it upon the cross. So was it the Torah that was nailed to the cross? No. no. It, was the hand, it was the dogma of men that were nailed to the cross. Then he goes on to say, and I've got to read it because I've memorized it all. Then he goes on to say, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Then he says... Let no man judge you in meat, drink, respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Sabbaton. Now, how is that generally understood? That, that you are not to be judged on keeping these things anymore because they were done away with. That's exactly the opposite. It's the opposite of what it's saying. Once again, this man comes along for the third time. What's the purpose of the man and the first two witnesses? To deceive you using words to get you to follow them. I'm, I'm going to do, do this survey, but I've done it all over the world for I don't know how many years now. And I'm going to suggest to you that most of you, when you began this walk, you started out with the Sabbath, the festivals, and the things you eat. The very three things that these new Gentiles are being judged in the first century by those people who are trying to get them to follow their traditions and their ways don't let any man judge you on these new things that you're doing and today with your brothers and sisters 
with those of you or the Christian church you belonged in or your family who do not agree with you, how many of them argue with you over putting the bird back in the nest with the mother? None of them argue. What are they always, what's always the problem? What I call the big four. The day you rest, the feast you celebrate, the things you eat, and what you call him. I call them the big four because those are personal things. The same three things that you and I are judged about today because these new Gentiles are coming out of Gnostic religious systems and what do they learn in Moses in the synagogue? Acts chapter 15. The first four things were given to them in order to establish fellowship, relationship, because that's the way everybody starts out, relationship. Then they will learn Moses in the synagogue. And in those days, what are the first four, three things? Not four, but the first three things they learned in the synagogue. The Sabbath, the festivals, and what is clean and what is unclean. That's the first things that we're taught. The first things we're taught today is those same three things, and those are the things that all our loved ones judge us over. And I'm going to suggest to you, if you go to Israel today, and you go down to Ben Yehuda Street, and you sit up a table on Ben Yehuda Street, and you start observing Passover there, some guy with a big fuzzy hat and pajamas is going to walk up to you, not trying to necessarily mock them, but you know, the, 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 the Polish immigrants still wear the big, okay. And they're going to say, what are you doing observing Pesach? You're not a Jew. And they're going to start picking apart everything that you do, because you're not Jewish. If you start observing Sabbath... In Israel today, they're going to come to you. Why are you observing Sabbath? That's a Jewish thing. Why are you eating kosher? Why are you eating clean things? That's only for Jews. We just talked about that earlier. Wherever you go, it's the same thing. Very quickly, yes, Shane. Pardon me? Well, that, well that's, a, that's a great question. That's kind of a given. But yeah, where does it say that's only for the Jews? But nonetheless, that is the current thinking. And so Paul is reflecting the same thing 2,000 years ago that you and I have to go through the day. The very first things we learn just coincidentally happen to be the very things that Paul mentions there in Colossians chapter 2. Just a coincidence that it's the Sabbath, the feast days, and the thing you eat. Because those are the first things you're going to be judged for. Why are you a Gentile observing Jewish things? And the same thing is happening today. And so the big four are very personal. And so that's why, that's where your division comes with your loved ones. Because what they're trying to say to you is this. Because you are observing the feast, you're observing the Sabbath, you're eating clean, and you're calling his name, you know, Yeshua, Yahweh, Yahuwah, things like that. All right? They're going to judge you about that. Why? Because from their point of view, don't you mess with my Jesus, the name. Don't you mess with my Sunday. Don't you mess with my Christmas. And don't you mess with my... Um, what was the third one? My bacon. Yes, yes. Don't you mess with my pork chops, okay? Is that not right? See, just seeing, just seeing in a normal experience what we go through the day, it's the opposite. It's saying that those new believers that are coming out of these Gnostic religions are being judged by those who are trying to get you to follow their traditions, their philosophies, and their ways, and they're judging you when you're trying to learn these feasts. That's, and, and I want to finish with this. Because then Paul says this. What do I do with my Bible? I already know it. But these are a shadow of things to come, but the body is a Messiah. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because one of the things that I teach the youth groups in America, uh, the Messianic youth groups, is that when you go to higher institutions of education, your professors are going to start coming to you and they're going to say, you know the reason why we don't believe in your God is because you can't see God and we're scientists and we base everything on observation which is poo poo anyway they, they threw out the observation a long time ago it's all mathematical equations now instead of signs or observing things but nonetheless I say when they say that to you here's what you need to say to them say Mr. Scientist do you believe that everything in the universe is made up of atoms and if they're good, honest scientists, they're going to say yes. And that is true. Everything in the universe made of matter is made up of atoms. And you're going to ask them, can anybody see an atom? Now, if they're honest scientists and they're keeping up with scientists, the reason I say this is because I'll do lectures at universities and things of that nature, and I'll have biologists and, and physics uh, and majors come up to me, uh, and, and they'll say that, uh, well, that's not what I learned uh, in my physics class, in my biology class. So I got, that, I got the scenario wrong. I'll have people come, that come to the conferences, 
And they'll say, I have a degree in biology that they got 30 years ago. All right? In other words, they're not keeping up with biology. And they're not keeping up with science. As a matter of fact, many of these guys who got physics degrees when they're 20 years old have been working at Starbucks for the last 30 years <laughs> and haven't been keeping up on science at all. And between me and my wife, who's smarter than me, uh, we, we keep up with these things. We re read these journals. We, we understand what science is learning uh, today and understand. But they don't keep up with these things. But if they're an honest scientist, they'll say, that's right, we can't see an atom. Then how is that you believe in something that you cannot see? Isn't that what you just accused us of? That we believe in something we cannot see, yet you stake your whole life and reputation on something that you have never seen. And I know what some of you are thinking. You mean we, we can't, yes, we can't see an atom with our, with our eyes, but there's microscopes that can. No, there's not. No, there's no microscopes that can see an atom. No man has ever seen an atom, but yet it's the basis of all biology. It's the basis of physics. It's the basis of astronomy. It's the basis of Einsteinian views and Newtonian laws based upon the atom, and nobody has yet to even see an atom. So if you ask them, how is it you can believe in something you've never seen, here's the response. Because we see the effects of atoms. Now that is true. But one thing I would like to mention, because someone brought this up, um, uh, in a conference one time. He said, you know, in 2004, science announced that they had a scanning, tunneling microscope that can now see an atom. Did you know that, sir? And I said, yes, I did. I said, the first thing I want to bring up is when did they do that? He said, 2004. And I said, what did they just admit? That they couldn't see an atom before 2004. Right? I mean, if, they, if, they, if, they, if, they, if there's a big article plastered on the Internet, man can now see an atom, what does that imply? He couldn't see it before 2004, yet everybody staked their life on it. But in reality, the head of the article says man can see an atom, but if you actually read the article itse itself, which is like most newspapers, the headline says nothing like the rest of it. They count on us not reading the rest of the article. Down in the article, they say, oh, it's, it's, this is actually a computer image of, uh, you know, interference patterns of electrons and some kind of lingo like that. And so they admit in the article that they still can't see an atom. And one of the reasons you know, and I wish I had it up here because I have it in my PowerPoints, is that when you see what they actually looked at at the CERN lab in Geneva, Switzerland, which is where this comes from, you'll see pixels in the picture. Atoms don't have pixels. Only computer screens and things like have pixels in them. So first of all, you know that's true. But they have the shadow of an atom. And someone sent me an article, or the articles, with one picture of them popping champagne in the CERN lab, looking for the God particle, popping champagne and celebrating. And the next one was this picture of an atom. But they don't call it the effects of an atom anymore. They call it the shadow of an atom. So we, if you ask them, how do you know atoms exist if you can't see them? And they say, because we see the shadow of the atom. And do they see the shadow? Yes, apparently they, they, they shot the shadow of an atom. Why do they call it a shadow? Because they know whatever's casting the shadow, they can't see. Then how do they know what it's doing and that it exists? They see the shadow. Now, why did Paul use the word shadow in Colossians chapter 2? Because Yeshua, that which is casting the shadow, is at the right hand of the Father. We can't see them. Then how do we know he exists and how do we know what he's doing? We observe the shadow. So Paul says these things, which are right from the Torah, including the feasts, are a shadow of things to come. He couldn't have laid it in our lap any clearer. He's telling you, if you observe the shadow, then you know what which is casting the shadow is doing. The same is true with an atom. If you're walking down the street, and you come to the ed you're coming toward the edge of a building, and you see a shadow going this way, Michael, and it's getting longer and bigger, that tells you it's getting closer to meeting you at the corner. No, if you didn't see the shadow, you wouldn't know what's coming around the corner. You wouldn't know, wouldn't know when. So it's observing the shadow that you know approximately when that thing is coming around the corner that you can't see. But the key to that, of course, is in order to see the shadow, you need light in your life. If you're walking around in darkness or you, and you threw the shadow out because the only time you can see shadow is when there's light. So traditional theology has said that the shadow, which is the Torah, it is true that the shadow is speaking of the Torah. And the feast and the, and the, and the dietary laws and the Sabbaths were an example of what these people were going to be judged in before he said these things are a shadow of things to come, but the body is Messiah. The body you can't see. It's the right hand of the Father. Then how do you know what he's doing? You observe the shadow. See, they want to throw out the shadow. The very thing 
that you observe in order to know that what you can't see is doing, they want to throw out. And when you do that, you have 50 different versions of end time prophecy because you threw out the very shadow. So once again, Paul's saying the opposite of what traditional theology teaches. Because anybody knows, why did he use the word shadow? For the same reason that these scientists use the word shadow. We can't see the actual atom itself, but we know what it's doing because we observe what the shadow is doing. Now that's a truthful scientific answer. That is exactly why. Okay, I hope that helped a little bit. Uh, so you can see that if you take these things in context, Paul is telling you that he already knew his own brothers in the flesh are going to try to get you to follow their traditions, their philosophies, and their ways. And the problem is there's nothing extensively wrong with that except they're not in you. The Messiah is in you. You follow him. Okay, we've got 30 minutes. I'll open it up to whatever other questions you want to ask. Yes, sir. The experience for me as a Jew is I come to places like this and I speak and that and then they have the, the food afterwards and if they have the, um, you know, the ham sandwich, I go, oh, no, thank you. And they mm -hmm. go, you don't eat ham? And I go, well, no. Mm -hmm. And it's so, uh, you kind of get it. I can't win either way. <laughs> I completely understand. I completely understand. Believe me. It seems like such a trivial thing. Uh, but once again, that's because we have a tendency to, to observe the universal world based upon our own personal experiences. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of you well know that this supposed trivial thing about not eating ham sandwiches and things like that is how the whole thing started in the beginning. They ate something God told them not to <laughs> eat. I mean, that's how the whole mess starts right there, uh, is doing something God told them not to do. But wh why did they do that? Because, uh, because Adam first didn't do something he was supposed to do. Remember, it didn't start with something that man did. It started with something with man was supposed to do that he didn't do. He was supposed to watch the garden. So the whole idea of sin and the pattern of that starts from Adam not watching the garden and letting the serpent come in. When you're protecting and guarding a garden, you don't let something like that come in. And so that's what started the whole thing. So what was the reaction of that? Eve gets deceived, and what do they do? They eat of the fruit. So these things come from something you didn't do that you should have done. Uh, yes, another question that we, may, that we may say? You can ask whatever you want. Yes, uh, Trish. This question of not eating bacon, whatever... Um, there seems to be different thoughts on that. You're right, then you're going half kosher rather than full kosher. Should we, you know, people that just ha don't have seafood and bacon, but they don't have a kosher kitchen, you know, where, where should we be in that issue? Okay. Um, f first of all, I'm going to suggest to you that, please bear with me as I go through the explanation, because technically the idea of kosher is a tradition or rabbinical thing and the idea of tame uh, something unclean so forth is a biblical thing and so the Bible focuses on clean and unclean the concept of of, of kosher uh, is a traditionally even though it's a biblical word it's, traditionally it's something that the rabbis developed based upon Talmudic principles and putting fences around that hole. So I'm going to suggest to you at the beginning, this is my opinion, at the beginning, I believe they had a good motivation. I believe in even the calendar issues, there was a good motivation for these things. What do we do when we're scattered all over the world, okay? And so we don't have a priest declaring from the temple, you know, when, when the moon uh, is, is full and all this kind of, or when it's uh, new and all these kind of things. So how do we deal these things when we're scattered throughout the earth? Especially when some of you are living in a completely different hemisphere, all right? But, but, but the point being, I believe, our, as, as for me and my house, we focus on not eating things that are unclean. And focus on tahir, okay? Those things are tahor, tahir, to clean things, as opposed to kosher. Because kosher eventually develops such minutia that it is, it's a burden that none of us can keep up with. And, and of course, it depends, as, as you said earlier, upon which rabbi you were listening 
to, they may have a different list of what is kosher and what is not kosher. So as for me and my house, we put a distinction between clean and unclean based upon what the Bible says, not upon, uh, I, I don't necessarily agree with the whole, the whole kitchen thing uh, with uh, boiling the kids in his mother's milk and all those kind of things. I don't necessarily agree that that's what it's being talked about. But I'm the one that has to stand before God. There's not going to be some rabbi standing before me in my defense. All of us here as individuals have to make a decision in our own life because we're going to stand before a mighty God and give an account of why we did this and why we did not do that or whatever based upon how we interpret and understand these things with the help uh, of other people. We're designed, remember, to do this all together at the same time. Shane, you had your hand up. Mm -hmm. Yes, it actually has to do with water and water penetrating um, the, the um, uh, lining in the cells, each one of the, of the cells. Okay? The idea of tamay in Hebrew is a word that has to do with surrounding. Both begin with a tet, for example. Taher, a toher, betended by using in a sentence, is a tet he resh. Tet he resh. And so involves, let me put the word up there. I mean, obviously, if you, if you look them up in a dictionary, Shane, I keep messing with the pens here. If you look them up in a dictionary, basically one's going to say clean without, um, uh, Tahir is going to tell you clean, I'm, I'm using Klein's definition, uh, clean without any, the penetration of something foreign. Clean as in something not penetrated with something foreign. No, I've never heard that definition. Uh, I, I, I can tell you that, that clean involves a letter that looks like this, a letter that looks like this, and a letter that looks like this. Okay? Uh, tet, he, resh. But each one of these words, even it's tame, okay, and I believe it's this. Okay. That's an I. Ayan. <laughs> okay, which is the Hebrew word for I. But the, the, the key to both of those is that this word, th this letter right here, the tet, which act, actually in ancient times was looking down in a basket. Okay? Because in baskets those days, they would weave the baskets and they put a bottom on it and then they take a brace across and put them at the bottom of the basket so it doesn't collapse on you. So the whole idea of a tet means something that collects, surrounds, and holds things. It's a basket is what it is. And so that's the meaning, of, that's the part of the natural meaning behind the word tet. But the idea is to round, it's surround something. There's two Hebrew letters that express the idea of surrounding. That and a samic. Samic also expresses the idea. As a matter of fact, the ancient samic looks like this. <laughs> okay, basically. It's just a circle like that. And it means to surround. And so the whole idea is to, is to see that which surrounds the waters, okay? And when something's unclean, things penetrate that, things that penetrate this. In other words, the idea is something unpenetrated by foreign material. And so when you see the idea of a basket of being a, something cyclical, because your cells are designed the same way. Your cells are little circles, and they have a wall around them. And if you are eating what is clean, that wall is very strong and doesn't let uh, uh, foreign de debris come into it if you're eating what is clean. In other words, if we do things the way they were designed to be in the first place, you have an automatic immune system, if you will, that stands against those things. And that if you're eating what is clean, you're doing what is right, then when you get on the airplane, someone coughs or sneezes, you don't care. Because you've got an immune system that's very strong because you're, you're doing what the God told you to do. However, if foreign material penetrates that, now it's unclean, now it's tame. So if you look up that in the Klein's Dictionary, one is basically going to say something that has not been penetrated with foreign material, and the unclean is that which just has been penetrated with foreign material. And so we look at the unclean things, for example, in Vayikra chapter 11, and we see that the conditions of what is clean and unclean has a lot to do with something many times you can't see. 
something you don't know. I mean, we know the whole idea of the cloven hoofs and the, and the four stomachs and all those kind of things. But there are some things that make something unclean based upon something you cannot see. Unfortunately, we're living in a culture today where even the clean things we can't eat many times because man has come along and messed with it and penetrated what God designed to be clean with what? Foreign material. So I'm going to suggest to you, even beyond the whole pictographic meaning of it, if you go to a typical etymological dictionary, which is what Klein's dictionary is, it's an etymological dictionary, one definition will be penetrate with foreign material, the other one is the ability, be, be, the ability not to be able to be penetrated with foreign material. And that makes a distinction between uh, clean and unclean. And so the Father simply lays out those things that he already knows. How many suggest to you that it's even possible that there were some things that were not unclean before the flood? And they became unclean because of the opening up of the skies and all those kind of things. But that's another subject for another time. Yes, Javi, and then, and then you, ma'am. Yes. No, you go ahead. Thank you. Um, sometimes I feel myself radical when I say uh, I don't want to eat even if it is taher food, clean food, mm -hmm. but if it is halal. Right. Is it right or wrong? Yeah. Well, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> There's a, there's, a, there's a couple of opinions about this, um, about the whole Hillel thing, and uh, eating food offered to idols. And, of course, some of you know that 99% of Paul's comments on food is not even really dealing with clean and unclean or, or uh, those kind of issues, but rather eating food offered to idols. That's 99% of what ever, uh, Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He's talking about what do we do when you guys are eating the food in the marketplace and these weaker brothers come in and they already know it's been offered to idols and you don't know. And what does he say? For the sake of the weaker brethren, don't do it because there's nothing unclean in and of itself. And that is absolutely true. Uh, and so when you read Romans chapter 14, it uses that phrase. They're not using the word there for clean and unclean. When it says unclean, there's nothing unclean in and of itself. They're using the word common. There's nothing common. It's not the Hebrew word for clean and unclean. It's the Hebrew word for something common. Koine. That's the word that's used in Romans chapter 14. There's nothing common in and of itself. People determine whether things are common or not common. Uh, however, clean and unclean is already determined from day one. I mean, things, things are already determined that way. A pig is a pig is a pig is a pig. It never was designed to be eaten. And so it's, it would be silly to say, well, a pig is not clean in and of itself. Oh, yeah, that's the whole definition of a pig. It is unclean in and of itself. But that's not the word that Paul is using in Romans 14. He doesn't use katharis or akatharis. He uses the word for common, koine. It's a whole different subject uh, there. And so, I forgot the original question. <laughs> oh, yeah, halal. Okay, I see I'm trying to avoid it. Anyway. <laughs> um, and because of my understanding of Paul, I'm a bit weary about walking into a Kentucky Fried Chicken. This is just me, and this is something that, uh, that I have to deal with other people that are close to me in, in my life as, as far as eating things that you already know are offered to idols. Because the Bible does say, do not eat things offered to idols. It does say that. But nine times out of ten, it's for the sake of the weaker brethren, because there's actually nothing wrong with the food. Beef is a beef is a beef is a beef. And as a matter of fact, some of this is based upon Paul when he says, if you're uncircumcised, do not seek to be circumcised. And if you're circumcised, do not seek to be uncircumcised. That's because those two phrases refer to uh, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Because from Judah's point of view, if you're not of Judah, you're the uncircumcised. That was a title given to you. You're called the uncircumcision. How many times does Paul use that? Over and over and over again. Okay? Especially in the book of Ephesians. The uncircumcised were those who were the non-Jews. They were not of uh, uh, Judah. Guess who the circumcised were? Judah. What he was basically around to say, if you're a Jew and you get yourself uncircumcised, guess what? You're still a Jew. You, you can't change that by being uncircumcised. However, if you're not a Jew, you can't become one by cutting yourself. You are still are what you are. 
Uh, and, and, and so the same is true with clean. Yeah, give, me, give me just a moment. I'll go right back to you. The same is true with clean and unclean. Unclean can't become clean. The only thing that can become, go from unclean to clean is humans because humans are the only ones given the ability to choose. A pig is not given the ability to choose to be something else. And so Hallel, getting back to that, trying to avoid it, but getting back to that, um, there's actually nothing wrong not that you should be eating at Kentucky Fried Chicken anyway, even if LL wasn't. But having said that, there's, I think what is being taught is there's actually nothing wrong with the chicken. The chicken didn't become something else because it was prayed over by the Muslims. However, they generally, when they do those prayers and so forth, they generally are offering those up to Allah. That is true. And so I'm just going to cop out by saying... You as an individual make that, need to make that individual decision in your own life. Uh, I, and I know it's very easy to say, you know, well, you just won't eat there. And right now, we can do that. We can make the decision. Well, I'll go somewhere else where they're not serving halal. But there's going to be a day real soon, and already has happened, in many wor- third world countries in particular, where everything's halal. You, you, can't, you can't avoid uh, everything uh, being halal. Uh, yes, and then here. Pretty, pretty much all of our yeah. mate. All that meeting, Coles and Woolworths is halal certified. And they have the ones that are now doing the halal without putting the certification on it because they know that some people just don't like Muslims for some reason. So because of that, they, they are removing the logo of halal to say, you know, well, we're, we're still going to do it. Yeah. And we're going to let you know, everyone know as a general we are. But, you know, basically anything you buy from Coles and Woolworths, right. meat wise or whatever, will be. Now, to suppose, me... If you go into, I, I've had the issue like going to a restaurant and then I've seen, like I actually went into one um, Thai restaurant and ate there and then as I finished eating the meal, the guy's got this little dish of meal that he then prayed over. I watched him pray and stick it up next to an idol that I never saw before. Right. I never saw yeah. the thing. Then he got some water and did the same thing. Three different locations in there. Now I won't go back in there. Mm-hmm. And I have started walking out of some places when I see the little cat with the little hand or any of those sort of idols. I'm like, and I'll go, you know, and I, I've started going, sorry, I can't, I can't give you my business because you, you have these false gods in here and I'll, I'll walk out. But that's just what I've been getting yeah. laid on my heart recently. Yeah. But how do you stop buying from Coles and Woolworths right. and getting your meat? You know, where do you go? Do you know what I mean? Right. So I, I think it's a conscience thing for me. Yeah, that's and I believe it's a conscience thing too. And I believe according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when it comes to what you just said, you walk in and you don't know because they did do that but as far as you know they removed it or you don't even know if they did that I think First Corinthians chapter 10 is saying then don't go in and eat and don't question it that's what he's, he's not saying sit down and eat unclean food and don't question it if you don't know he's not saying he's saying things offered to idols if you don't know but it, my question I think most people's question is, would be what if I already know maybe just maybe this may be even our father's way of getting his people to turn back to growing their own food, doing their own things without having to depend upon restaurants and stuff made by other people. Maybe he's trying to do that. I'm only suggesting the possibility. I'm not going to sit here and tell you, well, starve to death rather than eating something no as hell out. You make that individual decision to herself. Yes, hon. I'm sorry. And then you. She was first. Thank you. Um, you may have answered this, and I haven't been here the whole time. So, uh, but. I've heard it explained by different people um, because I've had an interest in Israel and all this kind of stuff for a long time. Um, so normal non-Jewish Christians, if that's the right term, Gentile Christians that are not eating ham right. and so on and so on. And the whole thing about all the food coming down and Peter, what to eat and all that stuff. And there was another, th- I hadn't thought of this till you said, but why did God create a pig then? That's another whole question. If he's not to be eaten, why is he existing? That's easy one to answer. Okay, yep. yes, 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 and, yep. and, and just as a Christian uh, with grace, and I, I don't want to give too much away here, but <laughs> it's not counselling, but yeah. I struggle with anxiety issues and OCD. Mm-hmm. The last thing I need is more dietary laws. Right to be compulsive about. So how do we as Christians be free and godly and obedient? Does that make sense? Yeah, oh, it makes sense. Because, because you can yeah. tie yourself up in knots and 
Right. You can't go anywhere or do anything because you might happen to touch a piece of ham. Yeah. You, you, you kind of know what I mean, and that's just I, bondage. I kind of know what you mean. Yes, ma'am, I understand bondage. what you mean. Let, let's answer that question before we get on to too many other uh, things. Uh, first of all, the establishment of what being free and liberty is all about was already established in the be very beginning. The psalmist tells us over and over and over that obeying God and following Him is freedom. It is your liberty. The Torah is truth, all those kind of things. The question that comes, the minutia that probably turns away uh, maybe a lot of Christians from this is not the commandments from God, but all the th other things that they hear from the religious systems that say are the commandments of God. And according to the Word of God, those are the things that are burdensome is what man has added to these things. When you think about it, most animals on this earth that are in abundant supply, it's almost as if the more you eat them, the more they propagate or clean. Most of the animals on earth, very few things are actually unclean. So that's the first thing. Um, once again, Paul's vision of the sheet, as some of you well know, had nothing to do with animals and unclean. It had to do with Peter going to Cornelius who is now a believer because he chose to follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He went from being an unclean Gentile to someone being clean in, his, in God's eyes because of what he did. That's why when you finish the vision of the sheet, it very clearly says that the whole purpose of this was that Cornelius was made clean by God, not the food. The vision of the, of, of the sheet had nothing to do with the food issues. Having said that, uh, yes, there, there are a lot of minutia of, of, of things uh, that you can and cannot do. Most of those, however, are actually not biblical, ma'am. I think you're going to find out that when you actually know the commandments and you go through the commandments, rather than relying on everybody's interpretation of it, you're going to find out that most things in this world available to you are clean, and God is just, now, that's not including the fact that man has messed with them and put chemicals in them, eh? It's going to be difficult to do anything. It's one of the reasons why I believe maybe the Father's forcing us to raise our own stuff because even the things He declared clean have been messed with and they may actually be no more good for you than eating the, the pork chops or whatever. Um, uh, the, the next thing, of course, is that God has uh, all things work together in God's e uh, ecological environment. He has an ecology. Pigs have a very important, unclean things have a very important part of the ecology of our wor world. Bacteria has a very important part in your body because it, 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 it takes all the garbage and all the bad things. If you didn't have any bacteria in you, then all your junk would still be in you. Ba bacteria is like the junkyard. You know, I got to have a place to take all the unclean stuff. And so, if there were no unclean things in the ocean, the ocean would have filled up with poop already. Okay, can I say that is okay? I just said it, okay. Uh, uh, and it, because all these scallops and all these kind of things are designed to scurry along the bottom and clean the ocean up. The pigs wander around the farmyard, if you ever have a pig, and they're eating everything in sight. Eating everything, uh, other animals, dead things, flies, garbage, everything. And then you turn around and eat what just ate all of that stuff. So you actually see the biblical laws. You'll see God's love for us contained in those laws. He loves us so much. He says, you know those things that I created? They have uh, uh, several stomachs that eat the grass and they digest it several times. Uh, those are the things I want you to eat. The things that are eating the things of the field. The carry-on and things like that, which are out there munching on dead bodies and rotted flesh out there, yuck, yuck. And then I don't want you to turn around and eat what ate all the, what just ate all that terrible stuff. You'll notice that actually um, uh, lobsters are just big roaches. You know, as a matter of fact, even very well-known Christians, Joel Osteen. Does everybody know who Joel Osteen is? This is my Bible. You know, the whole Joel Osteen thing. Okay. He did a very wonderful series. I don't know if you ever saw it on YouTube. He did a he, typical, traditional Christian. Went up there and told people, according to the word of God, we should be eating what God says for us to eat. And he took a big old lobster up there and a big roach and so forth. And everybody going, ah, okay. But the fact is, in our culture, someone else kills those things. All right, we don't see it. We're not involved in it. And so they package it up and they color it nice little colors and red and green and all this kind of stuff. And they serve it to you and you throw it in your mouth. And, um, and so actually when you come down to what the commandments actually say, most things are clean, 
that are available uh, to us in this world. Uh, deer and antelope and things of that nature are much cleaner animals than cows even. Uh, and those who are hunters know this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, a, a, a steak from a cow will shrivel up into nothing. A steak from a deer is pretty much stays the same size as when you put it in the pan. And uh, very healthy things to eat. And, but since we don't see those processes anymore, we, we, we don't see uh, the mess that, that these things went through. And so I don't know how much of that, uh, that answers, but actually the commandments of God are designed to, to be your freedom, to be your liberty. Um, because being healthy and being righteous is true freedom in your life. And you're not bound to the systems of the world. You're bound to the God who brought you into existence. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> I've enjoyed the day. Oh, last thank night. you. Um, but, uh, and I, I don't um, adhere to the um, food laws. Sure. But um, just a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. Are there any scientific um, uh, medical authority, uh, what's the word I want? Uh, well, authority or, or um, papers or books mm -hmm. that have been written about how uh, eating these things are bad for your health. Like you mentioned yep. you, an analogy of getting on a plane and then because you've got strong cell walls that you, know, you wouldn't get a cold. But yep. we, we all know that you get cold from droplet infection. Sure, sure. So does that mean that you don't get sick? Or you don't no, that get doesn't colds. Mean. So, uh, uh, do you know? Do you see where I'm? I coming know from? exactly what you're talking yeah. about. Yes, because we obviously we still live in a fallen world, and all things being uh, the way that we're designed to be, that's the way it was designed to be. Unfortunately, we live in a world where we're around everybody else, and a lot of these things don't. A lot of things we get actually don't come from eating unclean things. They come from other means. As far as what you brought up at first, uh, I would be willing to imagine. I'm just imagining that before or when this conference ends that not only me, but probably 30 other people in this congregation can give you website and source and books and journals after journals about how, uh, especially pigs and so forth, uh, all the things that are unhealthy for you uh, and these various things. And I bet you it's not only me, and I'd be happy to send you examples. Obviously, they're not in my uh, uh, shirt pocket right now, but I bet you a whole bunch of other people would be willing to do the same thing, okay? And you know why? Because we love you, dear. We love you with all our hearts, so much. Thank you, thank you, Thomas. Yes. Yeah, uh, not a question, but an answer to that. Um, if you have a look at what doctors say, what pregnant women should not eat, that includes a lot of stuff that's unclean. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to eat pork or any of those sort of you know, pork-based products. Um, they're advised to stay away from shellfish and that sort of thing. That's what the medical profession has already worked out. Um, I think there's a reason for that, why those things, the medical profession has now worked out that those are no good for pregnant, uh, pregnant women right. to eat. because of listeria. I've not known of pork though, um, especially cooked pork, but you know, hey, You're right. I'm not an expert. Right. My, by, by the way, one of those people, just from my point of view, that could give you all kinds of examples and not just, and these are not Hebrew roots scientists. <laughs> I just want to let you know, okay? They're all secular that have really no religious uh, affiliation with anything. My wife, who's ten times smarter than me, would be happy to give you all kinds of ex examples of that. But I'll bet you everybody else would too. Okay. Maybe Gee, who could that be? <laughs> yes, yes. Finally, Susanna, you can say something. Yes. Far away, hon. Um, with regards to these gifts, right? Mm -hmm. um, I like, suppose many here come came out of a. a Christian background where the gifts were operating yeah. um, and knowing that these things get perverted, how do you suggest we discern between true gifts and perverted gifts? Right. Okay. The first, did everybody hear what she just said? Okay. The first thing I would address with that is eldership in a congregation because it's my belief and I go through this in the whole Corinthian series but I'm not trying to point you to that necessarily. 
But I understand that concern right there. And, and I think in the, in the past, particularly maybe 100 years, we've lost the vision in traditional churches of what eldership are designed for. Many people come into eldership, it's because they give the most in the congregation and they end up having positions of authority. They get to teach once in a while, they get to do this. And meanwhile, one of the purposes of eldership is to be in a congregation and to make that discernment. Uh, that's why Paul says that the elders were given in order to make discernments within the congregation. If someone stands up and gives a prophecy in an unknown tongue, if there's no interpretation, they're supposed to sit down. But we don't do that in our assemblies. The place just starts going wild. How do I know that? Been there, done that. I'm sure you all have as well. So the tendency on the other end is to throw all the gifts out. And, and see, because we got the, you know, one thing or the other kind of thing. And d uh, elders are supposed to guide and direct, and, dis and they're supposed to have knowledge of the scriptures so they can play their part in making those decisions when the body. But most of the elders don't speak up and say a word. Uh, and in the congregation, I notice this in many places I go. There, why aren't the elders involved in what's going on here? Because typical uh, uh, Christian denominations, the pastors up there are leading people from uh, the congregation, and the elders basically hand out pamphlets or whatever and come to the elders' meetings. And they're they're supposed to, when something like that goes on in the congregation, they're the ones that are supposed to have the knowledge and understanding of the scriptures in order to make a discernment as to whether that person sits down and be quiet. I'm just using the one gift as an example. Sit down and be quiet until this thing is interpreted. Yeah. And instead, the place just goes massively chaotic, and it's running all over the place, and we've lost control of it. So my first answer to that would be, I think, that we need to train our elders to actually be elders, to actually lead. And, 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 and because one of the things that's assumed in 1 Timothy and 1 Thessalonians it's not spoken, but it's assumed because when you read the, the uh, qualifications for elders involves sober, husband of one wife, but it was, what's not mentioned there was always assumed, that they knew the scriptures. That's why they call them elders is because they knew that. And so based upon their knowledge of the scriptures, they're supposed to make that discernment. I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that that's left to us, if you will, as the laity, if I can count myself as that, to make those kind of decisions. Um, the elders need to make that. We need to hold them accountable, I guess. Hold them up to the, the responsibility they have to make those kind of decisions. Because most of that kind of stuff goes on in the assembly. Not necessarily in your backyard with your neighbor. Uh, or at the grocery store. <laughs> those things don't generally happen. It burst out in the congregation. And elders, for the most part, aren't doing their job. Okay? I hope that helps. Yes, hon? Mm-hmm. Okay, ladies, women wearing tallits. Well, once again, it's not my belief that tallits are what the scriptures teach us uh, to wear. It's seat seat. These, this is the commandment right here. Um, tallits and kippahs, um, even though there's nothing wrong with donning a tallit, and there's nothing wear wrong with wearing a kippah, are traditions that came along a little bit later. Uh, the commandment in Numbers chapter 15 is the seat seat. And if you read Numbers chapter 15, you're going to see it mentions the word tzitzit, number one, because that's the commandment. And then it tells you you wear them on the wings of your beged, your garment. All right? That's clothes. Now, the whole idea of the four corners came from Deuteronomy chapter 22. Four corners and things are not even mentioned in the commandments for, for tzitzit. That comes from Deuteronomy 22, in which the word seat seat is not used at all, but gadil is used there. That what's on the edges, which they translated in the English as fringes. So some people think that the fringes in English of Deuteronomy 22 is the fringes of the seat seat in Numbers chapter 15. And they're two, to two totally different things. If you read the context of Deuteronomy 22, they're talking about the things that they were going through in the wilderness. One of the things is he had them wear shoes that never wore out in the wilderness. Now he's talking about their clothing. Anybody knows that if you have clothing, if it's supposed to last during the wilderness, and it's not bound up in the fringes on the edges of your garment, it's frayed, how long will that garment last? Not very long. And so you bind them up. Here, we just, here today we just take sewing machines and we sew it up in the bottom and we put the fringe on the edges of our garments. That's the use of the word for. So seat seat, 
the commandment is not related to the, to the word for at all. It's not there in the, in, in the commandment. They, what the rabbis do is they take Deuteronomy 22 and combine it with Numbers chapter 15 and come up with a talit. Because if you're wearing them on your clothes, which I believe is what the commandment says, seat seat on the fringes of your, or wings, borders of your beget, your clothes, your garments. And I believe the reason why is because the purpose of seat seat is so you'll look upon them and be reminded of the commandments of God, right? That's what Numbers chapter 50, you'll look upon them. And so if you're wearing them on your clothes, your clothes are round. This is the thought process. Your clothes are round and your clothes don't have corners. And so, so therefore, they, they came up with a tallit and there's not ostensibly wrong with that, but that's a fence again. The commandment is the whole, remember? You put a seat seat singular on your garments. Why on your garments? Because you wear garments every day. If God would have said, put them on your snow boots, well then we'd only be wearing seat seat half the year, right? Because the other half the year is not snowing. But he says to put them on your garments. That's first of all. Why? Because people wear garments every day. And so Numbers chapter 15 does not have four or corners in it. Four and corners comes from where? Deuteronomy 22 and talking about their clothes lasting during the wilderness experience. Let me say that and then... Uh, there's a whole lot of other things I'd like to say, but let's, let's get another question. Right now behind you, hon. Um, yeah, yeah just, she's got the um, microphone. The difference between neos and kainos, is it the two news in Greek? Right, the, the two news. Um, first of all, if I think I know where you were going with this, okay? Both of them are very subtle in their meaning. And this is going to make some Hebrew roots people mad, okay? And I don't mean to. But... The Greek concept of kainos only means to, re, to renew when it's anakainos, not kainos, okay? Kainos in Greek translated as new. They're both very subtle meanings. One is new in quality. The other one is new in time, okay? So the idea of kainos is new in quality. The concept of neos is new in time. And so, a neo-Nazi, <laughs> hate to use that as an example, okay? A new Nazi is in time. The quality hasn't changed very much, but it's new in time. In other words, it's not the Nazis of the 1940s. They call them neo-Nazis because in time, we have this thing returning to us once again. Now, some Hebrew roots people teach that the idea of uh, Kadash and words like the Brit Kadasha and things like that, uh, new covenants, that the new covenant made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah is equal to Kainos, not Naos. And is that true? Yes, at least most times. But there is one, a couple of occasions when it's the, it's the same word, uh, Naos. But most of the time it's Kainos, new in quality. All right, and so that's pretty much what kainos means. But here's the key. Most people translate Jeremiah 31, 31 as a renewed covenant. Anybody who knows Hebrew well, really well are going to jump all over you on that. Because new is an adjective and renewed is a, is a, is a verb. Okay, a verb. And the word used in Jeremiah 31, 31, which is repeated in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8, is an adjective. It's describing the covenant. It's new. Renewed puts it as a verb. It's a, it's a different spelling. If it meant renewed, now I know I'm bursting some people's bubbles, but don't get me wrong, because there are different nuances of new. If you wanted to express restored in Greek, it would be anakinos, not kainos. Is everybody with me? You understand what I'm saying? Maybe it's getting a little <laughs> convoluted with words here. But people have a... Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, let's write it up on the board. Okay. Da, 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 da. 
Well, in, in, its, in its nuance, but, but in, it, it is a proper translation in English to say new covenant. That is proper. Okay, are you with me? Because, it's, because the word used in there in that form is an adjective. And renewed is not an adjective. Renewed is a verb. Renewed is the action of doing something. So that's a verb. And so they did translate it correctly as a new covenant. But there's different nuances of new. And so therefore we understand the concept of the moon sometimes is a new moon. But the nuances of course is that it goes through a cycle and then it returns again. All that part of it is true. It's just you can't say the word in Hebrew means renewed. It does not. It's properly translated as new because in that form I will make a brit kadashah. That is an adjective. That form makes it an adjective not a verb. Is everybody with me? Um, and so, of course, if it's a verb used as an adjective, <laughs> we call that an adverb. But let's don't get too much into the minutia there. I think all I'm trying to say is that if you want to understand, as I do, I understand that that covenant is, is new in the sense of the new moon. Even Raphael Hirsch will tell you that's the etymological root of that word. But you cannot t have a Bible, translate it yourself, and put renewed covenant there because that's a violation of the Hebrew word. Does that make sense? Because it's the same in, in Greek. If you wanted to express a renewed covenant in Greek, you would say anakinos, diatheke, or whatever the word is. You would say anakinos. Anna would be in front of it. That means repeat, do again. That's the Greek prefix for repeat, do something again. If it means an adjective, as in describing the covenant, then kainos should be translated as new as well. Does that make sense, hon? Okay. I have no idea what I just said. Would you explain it back to me? No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but that, that is true with respect to words. She was next. I was just going to say, um, sorry, back to the sequence. Yeah. Do you think that women need to Absolutely. You do? Right? Yes. And yes. Is that what you mean? Oh, and okay. I'm sorry. We didn't finish your question, did we? Okay. Okay. According to rabbinical Judaism today, women are not to wear these things. But in reality, that's changing too. If you've been in Israel lately, now all of a sudden they're starting to give in a little bit on that. But that's not my focus. My focus is the commandment. The major reason why people assume that it's only for men is because it says, Speak until the B'nai Israel. Okay? Which is in the masculine. Speak to the sons of Israel. But here's the thing. Hebrew doesn't have a neuter gender. And so in Hebrew, you either call a group of people all men or all women. But in Hebrew, when there's a mixture of people like in this room, it always defaults to the masculine. That's the reason why the word am, for example, people. People of Israel include women, but it's in the masculine. So the assumption is the people of Israel are just guys. Okay? See, Hebrew defaults to the masculine when it's describing a group, a mixed group of people. Then it defaults to the masculine. Like I said, you either got to call everybody because there's no neuter gender. There's no it. All the it's out there. There isn't that. So you got to call everybody males and everybody females. And so if I want to describe a mixed group of people, I would default. So the same word, B'nai Israel, came out of Egypt. Did only the men come out of Egypt? No. Oh. Yeah, yes, sir. Next. What's going to happen with LBGT? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. You rascal, you got me again. Okay, yeah, he, he, he brought this up before. Um, the whole confusion uh, in our world right now, if people don't know if they're males and female from one minute to the next, the whole, the whole confusion of genders and so forth. That's, that's, well, I, I, I understand that, and, and it's, 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 it's funny but sad. It's sad and funny at the same time. Okay. Um, but going, going back, I'm getting, you, you are next. Uh, what do me, the Messianic oh, Jews yeah. think of the rapture and of the building of the temple? Uh, most, uh, most people in Hebrew roots, in the Messianic Hebrew roots arena, I'm saying most people, Stephanie, not everybody, but I would say the majority do not believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Although there are... Uh, some who do believe in a pre I, I remember I was not I was disinvited one time uh, up, up to this congregation in Washington 
because they found out that I didn't believe in the pre-tribulation and rapture. I said, that's just one small thing of a whole bunch of other things. You know, I just thought that was ridiculous because we don't, you I mean, unless we all agree with every single thing, you're not going to have people come and speak to your congregation. Okay, but you know, that just gets filled up with another booking somewhere else, so I don't worry about it too much. Um, so most Hebrews people in Messianic do not believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, and I would suggest to you that most in the Hebrew roots Messianic arena, I use that under one big umbrella, uh, believe that there's going to be a literal rebuilding of a third temple, just to answer straight those two questions. Um, that, that, that's, that's beginning to change. I stand somewhere in the middle, uh, by the way. But did I finish answering your question? So in other words... It, the well, I, I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a matter of personal preference. I see a lot of young kids running around, uh, only this big, with seat seat on. And some might ask, you know, should we put them on someone who doesn't understand what this is all about? But then you have to make the decision. Do we... In order to train children from how to handle life, do we wait until they perfectly understand everything before they, or do we train them before time, and, and so they under, understand, and they're used to wearing these things, and then give them the explanation of why they're doing it. Everybody has to make that personal decision herself. Yes, honey. Yes, my wife. Oh, yes. Oh, thank you, Stephanie. I get to interview my own wife. There, there, is, just, there is a second part to women wearing tzitzio. Um Brad explained the benai Israel with a male, female, and no gender, you know, defaulting. But the, the second part to that is why are we wearing them? To remember the commandments that he's given us. I would ask you, are there any commandments for women then yes. don't we need reminding too? Yeah, I guess that's what she's trying to say. Women need to bring... If the purpose is to remind us of the commandments of God, then women need that constant memory uh, reminding as well. Before we get to the next two, which we'll close up here, can I just tell a very short story? Just very, very shortly. Now let's do that and then I'll tell the story. Yes. Um, here and then back to here again. Okay. Just a, just a very quick question here was that in terms of eating clean and unclean, or not eating the unclean, when you go to a restaurant, um, things may be cooked in, uh, in oils and other things that the, what's considered to be unclean was cooked as well. And, uh, I would avoid that like the plague. I would avoid that as much as you can. Otherwise, you're going to have to walk into every restaurant and say, okay, let me inspect your kitchen you know, before I do this. But, but there are some places where we already know most Chinese restaurants lump everyone into, the, into one big mess. There are a handful in the United States which are called bistros, Chinese bistros, and they, make, they separate uh, those things. But there is a few and far between, and I'm just going to suggest from my point of view and my walk in life at this uh, time, uh, I, do not, I won't, don't want to eat in a restaurant in which they mix all those into, into the same thing. I, I don't want to do that, and that, that's just uh, the nature of it. Um, uh, let me explain something very quick, if I could, uh, because CCO are, are very. Um, um, it, it comes up every Q and A. CCO comes up all the time, <laughs> believe it or not. And when I started wearing CCO back in the day, whenever that was, um, I when I would approach people because I'm on the road a lot, I'm in airports a lot. And if I'm going to get the stare, it's going to be in airports, okay? And my experience with this is every time someone sees me. They give me the double take. They don't look three times. They don't look once. But they always give the double take. Here's what they do. Okay. I get that everywhere I go. All right. So to start off with, um, I, I believe one of the things about the CCO. It, now, now remember, the commandment is so you look upon them. But I believe there's a secondary reason that's not denotatively stated, specifically stated. And that is to be a witness of him right. out there. And some people uh, who are more non-evangelical in the way they hand themselves will take them and tuck them inside their pants. My best friend, Bill Cloud. Some of you know who Bill Cloud is. Bill Cloud wears seats, but he wears them inside. Because Bill's not particularly evangelical. Bill is uh, Elvis has left the building kind of guy. Uh, 
Well, Don't you dare tell him I said that, okay? How can yeah. you look at the cheat seats if uh, they're hidden? That's right. Well, he looks upon them because he puts them on every day. That's what he says. Anyway, but, but nonetheless, uh, it, it, it's been a testimony. I have never had to carry one single chick track. This is what we call them. I never have to give somebody the four spiritual laws or think of cute things to say at the grocery store like, do you know that there's a giant hole in your heart that only God can fill? You know, and I, I don't have to think of cute little sayings. You know what I do? I just stand there. And people go like that. I was at the uh, Memphis airport one time at the ticket counter getting, getting a, a flight. And this is going to be a few minutes, so give me a chance to get to the story very quickly. Getting ready for a flight. And there's this guy, I didn't hear him because I was standing the other way. He says, Brad Scott, are you Brad Scott? And I turned around. This is in Memphis, Tennessee now. I turned around and he does the double take, you know. He does that. He, he had seen me on, you know, this show or this TV or whatever this thing or this DVD or whatever. And he had never seen me from the waist up. So this is the first time he ever saw me from the waist down. And so he sees these things and this is exactly the way he said it. He says, what's my mind on your bridge? I know, I said the same thing. What? <laughs> what in the world did you just say? And I said, slow down. And this is exactly what he said. What's the matter of things are hanging on your britches? <laughs> <laughs> it was the cutest thing I ever heard, Al Robin. It was so cute the way he said, said it. And so um, I, I went down to Central America one time, and I'm going to various villages, and I'm speaking in one place or another. And we had to go through a village in which, I'm not speaking there, but the people don't wear a lot of clothes in that village, okay? And uh, so this little girl, because I remember walking, I, I get a preface this, I remember walking through Walmart one time and somebody that used to go to the congregation that I pastored saw those. This is when I first started wearing it. And so uh, the only thing I knew, knew to do when I first started wearing it was to quote the passage. God forbid we quote the Bible, okay? And so he said, what are those? And I said, a seat seat. Where's that at? And I quoted numbers, and what do you think he said? Well, that's in the Old Testament. And he says, his, he says, isn't that a Jewish thing? And all I knew at the time was to quote the scripture. And so a few years go by, and I'm in Central America. Let's go back to the story. And in this village, this little girl is grabbing hold of this finger, and she's, yeah, la, 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 and she's swinging it back and forth. And that was kind of cute for about 10 minutes. But then after 10 minutes, it got to be a little irritating that she wouldn't let go of my finger. And so... I, I managed to wrestle away, and I went to a, a woman, uh, a grown-up, in a car, and I said, excuse me, but can you tell me why this little girl was doing this with my finger? And she goes over and talks to the girl. She comes back and says, the little girl wants to know, why are you wearing a piece of metal wrapped around your finger? And it dawned on me right there. Oh, I assume that this is, this is a man-made thing. A ring is man-made. There's nothing commanded by God to wear a ring on your finger. I think it's a good tradition. It's a tradition. I think it's a good one. But I assumed everybody does it, and all cultures don't do that. And so I realized that the re reason I'm wearing this ring is because when I wear it, it tells everybody around me, I'm married to my wife, Carol, her and her alone, all other women stay away. That's why I wear it, okay? Because it tells everybody that automatically from the tradition. So God tells us to do something. In which, when we wear these, it's telling me, I'm devoted to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, him and him alone, all other gods stay away. And that's a Jewish thing. Okay? The point I'm making is the man-made thing is okay. It's the God-made thing that people can't handle. We're okay with the man-made traditions. It's the one that comes from God that we don't want to do. And so I saw the hypocrisy in these things, okay? And so the, one of the main points of this is, is, is the testimony that, that comes along with it. It testifies. When you're in a foreign country and you see someone walking, I'm sure Avi's going through the same thing. You're in another place and you see somebody walking with seat seat on their clothes, not on a tallit, you know who that is. And you know what that brother is and it identifies yourself. I remember I'd be walking to the streets of other towns and I'd see somebody walking across the street with tzitzit on. I remember this is in Pueblo, Colorado not too long ago. And so I walk across the street and they start looking at me. I think I know you from somewhere. Because why? Well, one reason I'm wearing them. And see, there was a, there was a relationship there based upon something that you were, oh my goodness, it's a small world. Okay, I'll shut up 
Question over here. Can we make it the last one because my hips are going south? Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, Just son. on the, the tzitzit, when this? you are in Israel, um, for non-Jewish people to wear a tzitzit, it's very offensive to those of the brother Judah. How do we, how do you mm -hmm. um, engage, handle that offense in a right. sense that they have taken right because if we're trying to bridge a gap mm -hmm. of the two houses mm -hmm. the, the brothers the intent is not to offend right but obviously it is an offense so yep. okay that first of all if you all understood what she says when you were in israel yes son huh oh yeah carol tucks her in and that is what we do when i am in israel that is that it, first of all discernment has to be used because if you are wearing these in Israel the last time I did tours I told everybody you know it'd probably be a good idea if you didn't wear your seat seat hanging on your clothes because if you're not prepared to defend it you're gonna get engulfed and get over your head and you're gonna get blown away okay by the Orthodox here so it's just better if you just tuck them in or wear a tallit all right uh, now, the, I'm talking about parading around, walking around the streets of Jerusalem, things like that. I'm not talking about there can be circumstances in which um, you don these things, and they do ask you. There's times when Carol and I, remember Mark, uh, what's his face, who we're walking with on the way to, to, uh, from the um, hotel and to the hotel, and um, uh, the Cardo, I mean, and to the hotel. And uh, 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 the traditional rabbi comes down the street. We didn't have ours on, but he did. Remember, who was that? I can't remember who it was, but he had his on. And the rabbi comes over, engages him in a conversation. It was a really neat conversation because it basically got to, why do you love us so much? Things of that nature. And so I believe that there are times when you need to discern as to whether to do that or not. But you need to also add that to the fact that the more and more you go to the land, the more you see the blue threads on the talits because all these years uh, traditional orthodox do not have the tequila which is actually the commandment is the blue thread this is actually the commandment in your bible all this stuff is just tradition every bit of it this is actually the commandment right here and so uh, orthodox Jews for various reasons do not put the blue thread hanging on their uh, talits and so therefore more and more as people like us start visiting Israel more and more the shops are reacting to that and now they're selling seat seat with the blue thread in it uh, more and more this is happening and so but I'm, I'm just suggesting for practical sakes uh, I would not go to Israel and, and walk around with them hanging on your clothes now if you are prepared to engage yourself in an hour or two conversation and you can stand your ground Maybe you could go for it, but the average person will get overwhelmed by the anti-missionaries. I mean, the anti-missionaries will come out of the woodwork, uh, and they will swoop down on you. This was, wasn't something that was dominant in Israel 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but more people like us that show up in Israel, the more anti-missionary uh, ministries, Tobias Singer and people like that, start to rise up uh, because they see that, um, once again, what, make, what identifies them as Jews? the Torah and so that when they see non-Jews keeping the Torah they believe that you've stolen their identity and that gets very upsetting to them and so sometimes you have to draw the line and, and, and not wanting to offend anybody um, the same is true with any truth you know I mean there's sometimes there are things that are true but maybe it's not the appropriate time to do that you know sometimes um, uh, being right is not necessarily being right if you know what I mean. So you have to make those kind of discerning judgments uh, in your life. Yes, sir. I, I live in a place called Dianella, and um, there's X amount of shuls down there in a couple of synagogues, and we have um, Jews walking up and down every single day. And if, if I go to the shops, I see them down there, and if I turn around and wear tzitzit, I think I will be in for a problem. Yeah. And I'm not too sure whether that is the wisdom of God because one day I ended up wearing a kippah 
And be, I just felt I want to wear the kippah. I want to see how people are going to treat me. And I just sat down there. There's X amount of people that, you know, like said hello to me and all that type of thing, acknowledged me. And then there's other people which gave me the weirdest, dirty looks. Yeah, yeah. And I thought to myself, now, I know now what it's like for a Jewish person to be persecuted. Mm -hmm. Okay? So um, I'm not sure exactly where I stand now in whether I should be wearing tzitzit or where I shouldn't be wearing I know what the I know what the scriptures say. Yeah. The children of Israel will wear tzitzit. Okay, I belong to the house of Judah. Mm -hmm. being I've got mother in, and yes. father, which is Jewish. Uh, uh, but you know, X amount. Uh, yeah. So, what what do you do? Even even if I was a Gentile goyim, um, and I'm told to wear tzitzit, what what do you do in that situation? Well, like I said, I hate to be, repeat myself, but I think every situation. It's different, and you need to make that decision. That, that you got to have that kind of discernment on the fly, uh, and decide is this the appropriate time? Or it, sometimes in America we say, is this the hill I want to die on? Yeah. Kind of a thing. <laughs> um, and, and so we all need to make the decision on which hill we want to die on. And to me, the seat seat is not going to be the hill that's going to I'm going to die. What hill am I going to die on? Yeshua, who the Messiah is, and what He came to do. And, and am I witness and being a representative of Yeshua, the, uh, my Messiah, to the nation uh, of Israel and the house of Judah? That hill I will die on. Um, before you close, I've, there's only one thing, other thing I've got to say, and it's closing. It's not a comment, okay? I've got to make sure I, I get this in before uh, you all one at a time take off on me. Um, I, want, I want to end this by saying um, that uh, a few years ago, I say this all the time, uh, a few years ago, I got uh, on a particular website, and I regret the day that I ever looked on this website. I got it on it, and I, ch I checked it out, and ever since then, I have regretted it. I've asked for forgiveness from God for doing it, but I got on a website in which you put your birth date and a little bit of information, and it tells you how many weekends you have left in your life, okay? <laughs> what were you all thinking? Okay, anyway... Uh, and, and this, I don't know, this is like four or five years ago now. And when I went there, it told me I had 1,342 weekends left in my life. And so human nature, nature kicked in. And next week I said, okay, 1,341, now 1,340, now 1,339. I thought, how ridiculous is this? So I'm going to stop doing this. Now my point in telling that stupid little story is the reality is everyone in here really does only have so many weekends left in your life. That is absolutely true. You've only got so many left. And all of you took one of those precious weekends that you have left and you came and spent it with Carol and I here. And I speak for Carol and saying from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you and we are honored that you came and spent some time with us this weekend. Thank you. Be blessed in everything you set your hand to do. We're going to do the ironic blessing now, are we not? All right? Do you want me to do it or are you going to put it up there? Okay? All right. Let's finish with the blessing and all of you. Uh, be careful going home in the dark. May Yahweh guide you in everything that you set your hand to do. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the precious name of our Messiah and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen and amen. amen. Thank you all. See you next year amen. or the week after that or something like that. Bless you our Heavenly coming. Father, thank you so much for this weekend. Thank you for uh, taking um, uh, us all through this journey to uh, listen to your word. Thank you for the energy, for the anointing that you have given to us. Uh, to Brad and to Carol, um, and thank you for 
sending them to us. Father, you have spoken to all of us this weekend, and we, we are grateful for that and for being challenged, for being inspired and motivated. Um, you, you deserve all glory and honor. And uh, uh, as we said at the beginning, it's all about you. We want to keep that in mind every day of our life, Father. It's all about you and your kingdom and your fame. Father, as we take uh, all this information to our minds and hearts, I pray that your spirit will, uh, uh, will, uh, re will write your word and your commandments in our hearts. As, as you promised that you will um, pour out your spirit upon us and you will uh, replace a stony heart and uh, 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 take the stony heart and replace it with a heart of flesh so that we can keep and walk in your ordinances and all, all your commandments. And we are, we are grateful that you are faithful to that promise. And we thank you that you are doing right, right, uh, right now in our own hearts. And Father, for, for the time ahead, we pray that uh, uh, Brad and Carol will be uh, protected by you, um, we, we pray your protection, your grace, a double portion of grace, that you will be with them um, for the next days in, uh, in Albany, that you will be honored and glorified in the midst of your people there, and many people will be encouraged and challenged in their faith, and you will be honored and glorified. We pray, pray all these things in Yeshua's precious name, and everyone who agreed said, Amen. 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 Amen.